Bonjour et merci à, à toutes et à tous aussi pour être ici cet après-midi. On va continuer avec la troisième session de, de cette journée d'études. Je vais présenter Tiziana Leuti, qui est chercheuse au Centre d'études du Sud asiatique et himalayen au CNR, CNRS. Après ses études de danse classique et moderne à l'Académie nationale de danse de Rome et, et des danses Bharat Natyam et Odyssey en Inde, et auprès des maîtres actifs dans, la, dans le passé, des, dans les temples et les cours royales de l'Inde du Sud, elle obtient un doctorat de recherche en anthropologie sociale sur l'ethno-histoire de danseuses et courtisanes de l'Inde méridionale à l'École des hautes études en sciences sociales de Paris. Elle a publié deux volumes et plusieurs articles sur ce sujet de recherche et actuellement elle co-dirige deux séminaires, un atelier et un axe de recherche à l'École des hautes études en sciences sociales de Paris ainsi qu'un projet de recherche sur les histoires connectées de la danse auprès de la Maison des sciences de l'homme de Paris Nord. Et elle enseigne aussi la danse Baranatiam au Conservatoire de musique et danse Graviel Forêt de Lilas. Et merci beaucoup, Titiana, pour être ici. Alors, merci beaucoup à Irène pour la présentation. Grand merci aussi à aux organisatrices de cette, de cette um, très intéressante journée d'études. Um, et uh, vraiment, on va vite dans le cœur du, 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 du sujet. Uh, <coughs> oui, vous verrez des deux images de Niot et Niot, c'est simplement pour se souvenir d'elle. Je ne vais pas parler dans ma présentation, parce qu'ici, il y a d'autres spécialistes qui ont parlé ce matin de manière plus détaillée. Mais c'est intéressant, je voyais cette photo et la reproduction est aussi une, une peinture d'elle, sur cette connexion de ces deux portraits qui, euh, qui on voit. Alors, je vais voir si euh, avec, je pense que je dois faire avec, je n'ai pas l'habitude de travailler avec les PC, ce n'est pas comme ça. Je pense que c'est comme ça qu'il faut... Ah. Ok, parfait. Alors, c'est un grand plaisir d'être euh, invité ici. Euh, déjà, on, la dernière fois, c'était à l'occasion, justement, donc, je suis parti, j'avais l'honneur de participer à un comité d'évaluation des six temps d'articles qu'on qu avait reçus pour cette euh, monographie, cette, cette issue de la euh, numéro des perspectives, perspective, euh, qui était dédiée euh, à la danse. Dans, dans, entre autres, il y avait aussi Irène qui a participé à sept volumes. So, Lina Shah a déjà, euh, déjà depuis quelques années, s'intéresse à la connexion entre art visuel et art de la scène. So, je, et, <coughs> comme vous voyez, ça, ce sont deux, deux images, comme vous disais, en photo, un photo, un portrait, et, et aussi le, le, le portrait par les peintres hongrois, Lancelot Ney de euh, Nyota Inyoka. Euh, alors, la connexion entre danse, peinture, sculpture est très ancienne. Alors, euh, on imagine que probablement tous ces artistes se sont inspirés des danses réelles qu'on a vues pour euh, après les reproduire sur différents euh, matériaux. Alors, ça, c'est une. Je prends des exemples de l'Antiquité. Euh, ça vient des marijones de ma famille d'origine, au sud de l'Italie, on est au 5e siècle avant notre ère. C'est la le tombeau des danseuses, on l'appelle la roue des Puglia, qui euh, vous pouvez, c'est une danse probablement, une danse funèbre, euh, qui était, euh, qui maintenant, et ses peintures murales sont préservées, conservées au musée archéologique des national de Naples. Um, so ces danseuses, ces danses étaient modèles pour ces artistes. Ça, c'est un autre exemple de le tarde moyen âge italien. On a Florence, la basilica di Santa Maria Novella, où vous pouvez, pouvez voir plusieurs images des euh, figures féminines qui dansent. Um, pour revenir à l'Inde, on avait évoqué cette matin les Karanas, qui sont des séquences de lesquelles on a des traces dans la littérature, notamment dans les Natya Shastra, mais aussi uh, dans la sculpture et dans la peinture. Ici, on est au début du XIe siècle, dans les temples de Tanjavur, uh, dans le sud de l'Inde, où il y a les dieux Shiva lui-même, qui a été évoqué aussi cette matin, 
qui représente des séquences de danse, sachant que lui est le seigneur par excellence de la danse. Euh, et là aussi, des autres images, cette fois-ci ce sont des danseuses un peu plus tardives du deuxième et treizième siècle, où illustrent encore cette séquence de danse. Évidemment, ce semble des positions, mais il faut l'entendre comme, comme des mouvements extrêmement dynamiques. Et là encore, on, on imagine qu'il y a des artistes, des sculpteurs qui sont inspirés pour reproduire ça, des danses qui eux-mêmes avaient observé. Alors, évidemment, l'exemple le plus récent, des gars, des gars et la danse, et, et pour qui a étudié la danse, qui l'a représenté, euh, qui a eu aussi euh, travaillé dans les théâtres d'opéra, euh, on voit vraiment toute une série de séquences, on voit cette danseuse quand comme les voyez dans la salle qui se prépare avant les cours, ici à droite, célèbre cette peinture avec Jules Perrault, les grandes Jules Perrault qui donnent des cours à, à, aux élèves de l'opéra. Et on les voit dans différentes situations, à la barre qui sont en train de se préparer. Ce sont vraiment des moments, euh, et on sait bien que des gars passaient des heures et des heures et dans les coulisses et dans les salles de danse et, euh, et comme spectateurs. So, ça, sont très connus. Alors, encore une fois, les, danseurs, euh, les artistes qui sont des modèles pour d'autres artistes. Au en pot, au moment de repos, ou c'est des fonds d'étirement. Ou encore, vous voyez que vous lisez des, un journal à côté d'un de, 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 point de, de chaleur. Ou sur la scène, comme dans ces cas-là. Et on a eu hier ce magnifique moment de l'atelier au, au Musée Rodin. On remercie aussi pour, pour tous ceux qui ont participé, Lucie, et madame, je ne me souviens plus de votre nom, et tous les autres collègues qui ont participé. On a, et là, c'est un autre exemple, cioè, quelqu'un qui voit des représentations, les reproduit, dans les cas des rodents sur, sur du papier, avec des aquarelles différents. Bon. Euh, <coughs> Très bien connu. Mais euh, ça peut arriver aussi le, le contraire, exactement le processus contraire. Ça veut dire que euh, des artistes s'inspirent en regardant et des peintures et des sculptures, comme on l'a déjà évoqué ce matin, et vont créer des, 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 des formes nouvelles ou des nouvelles créations, on va dire. Alors, je commence avec la France, 19e siècle, François del Sartre. C'était un professeur extraordinaire, cette figure. À, 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 auquel on, on, on dit que c'est le précurseur qui ses principes, sa méthode ont créé le, le, la danse moderne, qu'est-ce qu'on appelle, même malgré lui, hein, lui ne s'intéressait pas du tout à la danse en réalité, c'était un prof des chants lyriques au conservatoire de Paris et à un moment de sa carrière terrible pour un prof des chants lyriques euh, il a des gros problèmes avec sa voix So, elle ne peut pas plus enseigner comme avant, elle ne peut pas plus chanter. Et cet événement terrible, en réalité, va déclencher tout un travail de recherche extrêmement intéressant. Dans le sens où lui commence à s'intéresser à la gestuelle, à l'expression du visage, à la gestuelle du corps. Et euh, pour enseigner ça aux, aux élèves euh, qui seront après chanteurs, acteurs aussi sur la scène théâtrale de l'époque. Mais la chose est très intéressante, excusez-moi, ah, pardon, euh, c'est que pour étudier cette gestuelle, lui allait dans la, dans, dans la rue, observer dans les parcs comment les gens bougeaient, euh, quels sont les gestes qui, qui employaient. Et parce que lui croyait que tout, tout sentiment, tout état d'âme correspond à un geste. Un geste. Et, mais pas seulement dans la, dans la vie quotidienne, mais lui allait dans les musées à regarder les statues, notamment les statues anciennes, mais pas seulement anciennes, pour analyser cette connexion entre l'état d'âme, les sentiments et la gestuelle. So, déjà ça, une inspiration, une analyse des sculptures et des peintures dans les musées. Un des de élèves, c'est l'américaine euh, James Morrison Steele McKay, qui était à Paris et qui a pris des cours euh, avec euh, François Del Sartre, euh, va amener aux États-Unis, en Amérique du Nord, le système, sachant que Del Sartre n'a jamais écrit ni un manuel, ni un traité. Ce sont seulement des notes manuscrites qui, 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 qui... Mais par contre, ces élèves ou les élèves de ces élèves ont beaucoup écrit et publié sous sa méthode hein, et la, en la transformant aussi énormément. Alors, 
Euh, ça, c'est une des élèves de Steelmaker qui, qui dit euh, Twitch spiritual function um, correspond à function of the body, Twitch grand function of the body correspond à spiritual act. Et, avec ces livres, souvent, sont illustrés avec des dessins. Mais une des élèves, peut-être la plus intéressante pour nous, et peut-être aussi une des plus importantes, c'est Genevieve Stebbins, qui a écrit plusieurs livres, euh, entre autres aussi sur, sur les systèmes d'expression de Delsart, sachant que ce mouvement qu'on appelle Delsartisme a un développement incroyable aux États-Unis. Et, et elle, on peut considérer comme une pionnière de la danse euh, moderne. Pourquoi Elle aussi, comme Delsart, a passé des heures et des heures dans les musées en Amérique et en Europe. Elle a voyagé beaucoup en Europe pour copier, euh, dessiner toutes les sculptures anciennes. Et après, elle travaillait sur cette esquisse et travaillait sur elle-même. Ça veut dire qu'elle essayait de reproduire ses mouvements se positionne et inventer des mouvements. Ça, c'est très important. Euh, entre autres, au Louvre, euh, des figures féminines extrêmement puissantes. Important aussi les habits. Regardez les tuniques anciennes. Euh, Atlanta, par exemple, la figure d'Atlanta qui est de la, de la mythologie, c'est une jeune fille qui est grandie comme un garçon parce que le, le père n'avait pas des fils, sauf l'entraîne à être une guerrière. Ce sont des figures extrêmement dynamiques qui elle reproduit dans, son, dans ses travaux. Mais la chose pour laquelle, évidemment, les figures, on va les retrouver, de la Vénus de Milo, dans les musées de Louvre, aussi dans les musées euh, archéologiques, Calipige, avec les belles fesses, en grec, Calipige, ça veut dire avec des belles fesses. Euh, très important, elle, dans ses traités, euh, reproduit avec des expressions euh, connaissables, mais regardez aussi les, 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 les tuniques. Euh, en réalité, il y a tout un mouvement, aussi féministe, qui, à la fin du XIXe siècle, rejette un des éléments fondamentaux des, des habits de l'époque, les corsets qui empêchait vraiment les mouvements, la respiration des femmes. Ça, c'est un exemple de la Vénus de Milo et des de corsets à la mode euh, en France et dans tout le monde occidental à l'époque. Et euh, on voit aussi des, comme déformer les os, euh, comme empêcher la circulation et aussi la respiration. Ça, c'était vraiment très contraignant d'un point de vue de santé et aussi de mouvement. Et il y a dans tous ces qui suivent le, le, le système de Delsart, première Genevieve Stebbins, qui enlève le corset avec grand, grand scandale à l'époque. Mais cette fait, cette geste permet toute une série de mouvements à, absolument impossibles avant. Et on invente aussi les corsets, euh, comme on dit, euh, de, 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 de la publicité pour des corsets. Euh, qui sont des corsets euh, d'Elsarten, qui permettent tous ces mouvements, euh, ces mouvements qui sont à la fois et des danses et des gymnastiques. Et vous voyez d'autres, si les femmes commencent à aller à, en vélo, so, il faut réduire la, 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 le contrôle de, du corset. Elle écrit pour plusieurs livres, qu'est-ce qu'on appelle la, en, aux États-Unis l'harmonique gymnastique, la, la gymnastique harmonique inspirée du système de Delsart. Et vous voyez cette, mot, euh, cette dicton, Beauty and Health, et l'exemple de cette calisthenics, c'est une forme de gymnastique inspirée de Delsart, c'est la Vénus de Milo, qui est libre, euh, qui n'a pas tous les contraintes du corset. Euh, ça, alors, une chercheuse américaine, Nancy Reuter, qui a beaucoup travaillé sur, sur Genevieve Stebb, considère elle vraiment la pionnière de la danse américaine, moderne, mais qui n'a pas eu beaucoup d'attention. C'est parti comme gnocca et gnocca de, de, de ces grands artistes qui étaient ignorés pour longtemps et qui seulement récemment étaient objets de recherche et qui euh, ont inspiré euh, certainement Isadora Dank, mais même, même si Isadora Dank s'est considérée autodidacte, ce n'est pas vrai. On la voit ici qui avait pris des cours de danse classique, mais c'était beaucoup inspiré de, de, des ouvrages de euh, Genevieve Stebbins. 
elle aussi, on voit, ça c'est l'ouvrage de Stebbings, elle aussi qui, avec des tuniques euh, à la façon grecque, euh, elle aussi a beaucoup travaillé dans les musées, dans les, dans les ruines aussi. Euh, pendant ses voyages, reproduit euh, vraiment des mm, séquences de danses inspirées par les danses anciennes. On a plusieurs photos d'elle, mais même le, le costume, le fait d'être à pieds nus ou avec des sandales, et les, les Isadorables qui ont eu un rôle fondamental. Mais on n'a pas le temps de, de parler ici. Un autre qui était, mais qui elle le dit elle-même, inspiré par euh, Geneviève Stebbings, est Ruth St. Dennis, de laquelle on parlera aussi tout à l'heure, qui était déjà évoquée cet matin, qui, elle, décide de devenir danseuse après avoir vu une représentation de Geneviève Stebbings euh, à la fin du XIXe siècle aux États-Unis. Et euh, là, il y a une description dans son autobiographie. Et vous voyez aussi des exemples de, de Ruth St. Dennis and, euh, et son partenaire euh, artistique et Marie Ted Schoen. Ça, c'est très important. Ruth St. Dennis vient au début du, du siècle, cioè, euh, en tournée avec David Belasco euh, en Europe, notamment à, en France, quand il y avait l'exposition universelle de, de Paris de 1900. Elle a eu la possibilité, dans les pavillons de l'Inde française et de l'Inde anglaise, de voir aussi des, des formes spectaculaires, aussi des danses, des théâtres, comme c'était à l'époque pendant la, et dans d'autres pavillons aussi de les coloniales, aussi de les, de, 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 pendant cette exposition. Et encore une fois, elle s'inspire quand elle rentre aux États-Unis. Euh, un jour, le disent dans sa autobiographie, voit les posters d'une euh, publicité des cigarettes où il y a Egyptian Deities, c'est une représentation des Isis, s'inspire de ça et vraiment des de, de, de grands, euh, comment on dit, un élan créatif et sous inspiration égyptienne. Mais le moment crucial, on a dit euh, Paris 1900, 1900 euh, quelques années après, à Coney Island, euh, à New York, cette sorte de Luna Park un peu, de, de, un peu particulier que c'est à l'époque, euh, il y avait des reproductions, un peu comme dans l'exposition universelle, des choses aussi exotiques, vous voyez là un chameau, les gens pour le monter, ou sur les éléphants indiennes, euh, assiste à un spectacle de danse de danseuses indiennes, probablement du nord de l'Inde, et euh, reste fulgoré, inspiré, et commence à se euh, documenter dans les bibliothèques locales à, aux États-Unis, euh, les miniatures indiennes, comme ça, et à, grâce à tout ce travail de documentation, euh, va créer euh, ce qui la rendra célèbre, c'est cette pièce Rada. Uh, the Mystic Dance of the Five Senses in New York in 1906. Intéressant la musique d'accompagnement, quelqu'un en a parlé ce matin, c'est uh, pas du tout indienne, au contraire, on a la, c'est Léo Delib, l'opéra la, Lacmé, sous inspiration indienne de la fin du 19e siècle, sous so, cette commission entre, ce sont quelques images, vous connaissez certainement, très célèbres. Mais un autre, euh, comme on l'avait évoqué ce matin aussi, euh, la publication très marquante de la publication de Dance of Shiva par Ananda Kumarasbami euh, en 1918, euh, a un rôle, joue un rôle fondamental dans tout cet imaginaire, aussi de Ruth St. Dennis et de son compagnon. À propos de ça, euh, on avait en euh, 2012, avec un collègue de l'Université de Lausanne, on avait organisé un euh, colloque international, notamment sur ça, sur la danse des Shiva, qui, justement, euh, Irène a parlé, les, les, les actes du colloque sont, bientôt vont sortir, euh, sous ce travail entre références anciennes et mes créations de modernité, hein, qu'on qu qu parlait avant. Um, Ruth St. Dennis et Ted Schoen avec la compagnie, la Denis Schoen, voyagent pour la première fois en Asie, euh, dans plusieurs pays de l'Asie, on parlera de ça plus tard, et, euh, et, et vous voyez ici, elles sont en Inde en 2016, 2000, 2000, 1926, 
et assiste aussi euh, de la présentation locale. Et encore une fois, on parlait de le, le, le Shiva Nataraj, cette, maintenant, cette icône qui, avec les CD. Mais euh, c'était très important. D'ailleurs, aussi Rodin euh, était beaucoup inspiré de cette, de cette image, de cette bronze de, de l'Inde du Sud euh, médiéval. Et euh, on voit euh, Ted Schoen qui reproduit, tu vois, s'inspire de cette, de cette pièce euh, en 28 après sa tournée euh, en Asie de cette danse. Et je voudrais aussi terminer. Pour, euh, avec Matahari, qui est une autre, euh, comme on dit, marginalisée, figure marginalisée, et qui, selon moi et d'autres chercheurs aussi, était extrêmement importante, même s'il n'a pas eu le même euh, type d'études hollandaises extraordinaires, qui, avant même que Ruth and Dennis, un an avant, euh, au musée Guimet, dans la rotonde du musée Guimet, ayant comme, euh, comme on dit plusieurs images, entre autres le Shiva Nataraj, euh, a représenté ces danses qui à l'époque étaient considérées des danses brahmaniques, mais qui fait partie de ce mouvement euh, de euh, qu ce qu'on appelle le, le, la, les danses hindoues, aussi en décoré, Aïe en a, a parlé, mais qui c'est un mouvement extrêmement intéressant, parce que même Ruth Sendenis, euh, elle s'inventait une biographie imaginaire, hein, quand elle était ici à Paris, racontait qu'elle était fille d'une danseuse hindoue qui, qui était grandie dans les temples, comme ça. Ça, 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 ça vraiment fait partie de tous les personnages. Même Ruth Sendenis fait la même chose, comme le faisait d'ailleurs aussi Matahari. Et, mais euh, pour plusieurs raisons, la nudité, par exemple, le fait d'encore libérer du corset à l'époque, ont anticipé, entre autres, toute une série d'éléments qui, euh, comme euh, Isadora Duncan, Ruth Sendenis et d'autres, ont donné lieu à qu ce qu'on parlait cette matin, cette idée de légitimer sa propre lignage artistique avec des choses super traditionnelles, qui n'était pas vrai, mais aussi a donné lieu à des créations. Ça, on ne peut pas imaginer la danse moderne sans tout cet, tout cet élément. Et, et c'est pour ça que je laisse avec euh, Matahari et merci pour votre attention. Merci beaucoup, Tiziana. Euh, bon, euh, la prochaine intervenante, euh, Kakali Parakamburu, je, je la présenterai. Donc, peut-être la question maintenant Ah, d'accord. Okay. Ap... D'accord. Alors, Kakali, je crois, vous pouvez toujours nous entendre parce qu'elle n'est pas là. Euh, J'expliquerai qu'elle, finalement, elle, elle n'a pas pu voyager. Euh, et elle, elle vit aux états unis et bon, on, elle a eu problème avec euh, les temps pour euh, obtenir son visa, alors on va l'écouter sur Zoom, mais j'ouvre la parole euh, si vous voulez faire quelques questions à, à, à Tiziana avant, avant la prochaine euh, présentation. Bonjour. Je vous propose quelque chose, juste pour vous laisser un peu de temps pour réfléchir. Je ne sais pas si, si tu peux, on peut parler un petit peu en plus de... Parce que je sais qu'à cause du temps, vous avez passé très vite. Et par rapport à... Tu évoquais beaucoup les sources grecques de de l'époque ancienne, un peu rattaché à la culture occidentale par rapport à Geneviève Stebbins. Mais je voudrais aussi te demander par rapport aux, aux sources asiatiques euh, ouais. qu'elle a mis vraiment, je crois, dans, dans plusieurs textes. A, je crois qu'elle a écrit vraiment beaucoup. Je ne sais pas combien de publications, mais beaucoup. Et comment se produit ce mélange de sources de la Grèce et de cette antiquité qui est plutôt liée à, à la culture européenne traditionnellement dans l'historiographie, je sais qu'on peut 
toujours nous demander par rapport aux origines de l'Europe dans la Grèce, et aussi comment est-ce qu'elle... Parce que je crois que ça va, être, ça va avoir un rapport aussi avec la prochaine intervention, euh, qu'est-ce qu'elle prend de, de la scie, le ouais. yoga, l'Inde, la respiration et, et tout ça alors, euh, alors, de l'Asie, du Moyen-Orient, euh, par exemple, s'inspire beaucoup des de de les fouilles euh, archéologiques en Mésopotamie, sur tous les cultes, par exemple, d'Ishtar, euh, de la Dest, Ishtar, Isis, en Égypte, parce qu'il y avait beaucoup aussi, de, de, même, à, même dans la Méditerranée, il y a beaucoup de, 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 des exemples, même à Pompéi, ou des dans des ruines. Euh, euh, par rapport à l'Inde, elles disent euh, que euh, quand elle était à Londres, elle avait rencontré un pandit. Elle ne parle pas, elle ne donne pas de nom. Euh, et selon elle, elle avait appris le, les techniques de le yoga, euh, notamment de la respiration, qui emploie après dans ses, ses écrits, par cette maître indienne. Euh, L'Inde... Euh, a joué un rôle important et en fait, à un moment donné, et je pense que ce sont toutes ces connexions avec l'ésotérisme de lequel on parlait avant, euh, la société théosophique, même si elle n'était pas rattachée à la société théosophique, mais elle était rattachée à une autre société euh, américaine d'origine avec des fondateurs qui, si je ne me trompe pas, étaient écossais, euh, ésotériques, liés au mouvement d'Hermès, euh, des choses qui étaient rival de la société théosophique, mais quand même partager tout cet imaginaire aussi. Et, et à un moment donné, elle part en Inde. Elle part en Inde euh, et, et là, on, on perd de ses traces. Euh, on perd de ses traces, on ne sait pas qu'est-ce qu'elle a fait, où elle est allée, qui a vu. Euh, à un moment donné, on même pensait qu'elle était disparue soit intentionnellement, dans le sens où vous ne pas donner notice, des, des nouvelles d'elle, soit parce que lui était arrivé quelque chose. Et seulement récemment, euh, on, on pense qu'elle était rentrée aux États-Unis et qui est morte euh, dans les années 30. Mais euh, cette deuxième période de sa vie est très... On ne connaît pas trop. On ne sait pas si la personne est la même... Et Mais l'Inde a joué un rôle fondamental. So, c'est important, c'est ça, parce qu'effectivement, moi, je pense dans l'intervention euh, qui suit, l'affiliation entre Martha Graham, euh, le yoga de Martha Graham, il faut passer à travers euh, la Denishon, Ruth and Dennis and, and uh, uh, Ted Shone. Euh, et euh, à travers euh, Ruth and Dennis et, et l'affiliation avec euh, Genevieve Stebbings. So, euh, as far as I know, c'est jusqu'à maintenant, vraiment, on peut tracer cette connaissance du yoga déjà au 19e siècle, et notamment aux États-Unis avec elle. Mais il y a aussi un point d'interrogation, parce qu'elle ne cite pas son maître, Chose qui fait, par exemple, pour tous les autres maîtres qu'il y a eu, soit des gymnastiques, soit des théâtres. So, Est-ce qu'effectivement, rencontrer quelqu'un, euh, que, on ne sait pas. Mais certainement, elle avait une connaissance des techniques yoga qui intègre dans son travail, dans sa méthode. Merci. Merci. Il y a ici tout un... Un autre sujet qui, qui, qui n'est pas vraiment le sujet de cette journée, par rapport aussi à, à la construction du yoga, il y a ici des personnes qui, qui connaissent bien le, le domaine. Et je ne sais pas s'il y a des autres commentaires, questions. Oui. Merci. Euh, je promets que je ne suis pas, comme je, vous l'avez prévu, je ne suis pas un étudiant de l'histoire de la danse. Moi, je m'occupe notamment de, de la réception de l'antiquité classique dans la deuxième moitié du, du 19e siècle. En fait. Mais euh, bah, je suis très content d'avoir vu les, les danseuses de Rouveau dans votre, dans votre euh, PowerPoint parce que c'est une des, euh, des fresques anciennes de l'antiquité classique les plus reprises par la peinture. Euh, des de revivals classiques dans les années, dans les années 70 euh, environ. Il y a une peintre italienne euh, qui, qui étudie à Naples, en fait, qui s'appelle Francesco Netti, qui est vraiment mm. obsessionné par ces, ces fresques-là. Il, il en a fait beaucoup. 
Et je me suis, j'étais en train de me demander parce qu'il y a vraiment une saison de, des redécouvertes de l'antiquité classique dans le sens de, de faire vivre cette antiquité-là, mmh. euh, dans les arts visuels, euh, dans la peinture notamment, mais moi aussi dans la, dans la sculpture, dans les années 70 et 80 du 19e siècle. Et je n'ai jamais pensé à ces, cet égard sur les statues classiques comme des danseuses, tout à fait, euh, qui, qui, ont, qui a eu lieu un peu plus tard, mais je pense qu'il serait intéressant de croiser cette, cette tentative-là sur l'Antiquité, et pas seulement sur l'Antiquité classique, comme vous l'avez prévu, dans les arts visuels et dans l'histoire de la danse, parce que je pense qu'il y a une, une température de, du moment historique qui en fait qui, dans ces, ces deux histoires qui ont se sont jamais croisés dans ces scènes-là, des réceptions de, de l'antiquité classique ou même pas, pas occidentale. Euh, euh, on, peut, on peut trouver des, des liens intéressants sur cette Et ça, ça a duré jusqu'à les années 70, parce que, par exemple, quand j'étais élève de l'Académie nationale des danses de Rome, qui était fondée par un artiste russe, Eugenia Borisenko, qui, était, qui avait étudié en Russie la... la la, la rythmique, le, aussi le, comme le dersartisme aussi est arrivé en Russie, ça c'est un autre chapitre, et, et qui était beaucoup influencé de, de, de tout cet imaginaire classique. Et j'ai parlé avec un, une de mes enseignantes qui était là quand elle était vivante, et par exemple à l'Académie des danses à Rome, tous les, elle respectait certains, certains euh, fêtes euh, gréco-romaines. Et à Rome, c'est très facile parce qu'on a tous les, les ruines. Et tous ces jeunes élèves partaient habillés avec des tuniques à la manière très euh, grecque jusqu'à les années so 60 hein, et faisaient toutes ces processions dans les temples romains, dans les ruines et tout ça. Sur so, cet imaginaire qui commence à la fin du 19e, en réalité, ça continue jusqu'à. et qui euh, donnait lieu vraiment à toute une série d'expérimentations d'avant-garde en danse. Parce qu'en s'inspirant de l'Antiquité, mais produisait de, de la danse moderne. Elle avait un, un système aussi qui des de, de écritures, euh, qu'est-ce qu'elle appelait la orchestographie, euh, qui était inspirée beaucoup dans les sculptures. Dans... So, il y a eu toujours cette symbiose jusqu'à récemment, au siècle dernier. Bon, merci beaucoup. Euh, merci à vous. Comme on a dit juste à l'avant, euh, il y a Kakali Paramguru qui va intervenir maintenant, mais elle va le faire euh, via euh, vidéoconférence, car, elle, car finalement elle, elle n'a pas réussi à, à voyager à, à Paris. C'est Pauline qui va préparer. Je vais faire une petite présentation. Kakali Paramguru est actuellement en train d'obtenir son doctorat en danse à l'université de Temple en Philadelphie et c'est une partie de sa thèse qu'elle va présenter aujourd'hui. Sa thèse porte sur Martha Graham et la présence non reconnue de l'esthétique indienne dans son travail des années 1920 à 1958 aussi qu'à l'intérêt exploré des danseurs indiens pour l'esthétique de la danse de Graham et entre 1964 et les années 2000. Dans ses recherches, elle se concentre sur l'étude littéraire comparative de l'esthétique philosophique de la politique et de l'orientalisme et du modernisme de l'Amérique et de l'Inde du XXe siècle. Auparavant, Kakali, disciple du gourou de la danse classique indienne Odyssey, Durga Charan Ranbir, s'est produit en solo en Inde et aussi à l'étranger. Elle a reçu plusieurs bourses pour le développement de ses recherches. Et parmi ses publications, on peut citer par exemple The Science and Art Reunion, et dans une publication de 2002, ou Cultural Cascade from Language to Language of Odyssey Dance, dans une dans l'International Conference of Indian Cultural Heritage en 2017. Merci Kakali pour, pour ton intervention. Ok. Ok. Um. Can you can you try to Kakali? Can you hear us? I don't think so. Okay. Um. Oh. Uh, can you hear me? 
Yes. Yes. And can, can you hear us? Apparently not. Uh, da, da, da. Wait. Okay, great. Um, but if you can hear me, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the text because I am not able to hear anything at all. But uh, if you can hear me, then that is fine, I think. So, hi everyone. Thank you so much to Pauline Chevalier, Irene uh, Lopez Arnaiz, Ileana Valentin, Matilda Dubois and the whole team of the INHA, Institute of National Day History, Day Art, for inviting me to this study day here. My name is Kakari Parampuru. My doctoral dissertation was about the relation and exchange between Martha Graham and India. And today I will speak about the influence of yoga philosophies on Martha Graham technique during her early stage from 1916 till 1940s. Can I one sec for one second stop sharing and then uh -huh. then begin? So sorry. I'm sorry about that. So my outline for this presentation would be about my positionality as a OBC dancer, then yoga, Sam tennis, and Martha Graham, scholarship on Graham, Graham and yoga philosophies, and readings with the yoga philosophies that Graham read. I have been a performer and researcher of Odyssey dance in the style of late Guru Sri Devaprasad Das, discussing the multiple styles within Odyssey, dance scholar Anuriva Banerjee credits two figures for bringing Odyssey into international consciousness, Indani Rema and Guru Devaprasad Das, and says, Devaprasad Das integrated tribal, shakti, and tantric elements, including Shabda Sora Patha, which is a linguistic aspect, into his repertoire. This project is inspired in part by the similarities in aesthetics and movement vocabularies I noticed between Graham Odyssey dance from my own experience. Graham was on good terms with three generations of family of artists with Odyssey background. Ragini Devi, her daughter Indrani Rehman, and Rehman's daughter Sukanya Rehman. You can see in the picture, uh, it's Indrani Rehman standing on the left, then Martha Graham on the right, and Tate John in the middle. And this was from a performance that Indrani Rehman performed at Jacobs Below in the 1960. Given Graham's connection to Odyssey dancers, it is hard not to wonder if Martha Graham knew 
My guru, Devapratha Das, a personal question motivating my research. My study to understand this relationship included Graham's exposure to Indian intellectuals through Roots and Dennis, Graham's subsequent readings on Indian aesthetics as recorded in her notebook, her interactions with artists and scholars in India during her Asian tour 1955-56, with Indian critical reception on her dances, and her interest in the Indian dances she saw. The interest in Graham of a younger generation of Indian dancers. Today, I will focus to her early days and the influence of yoga on her technique. Yoga came to the US in the 19th century through the Theosophical Society and was popularized by Vedanta philosopher Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda was an important figure in the cross-cultural propagation of yoga. Genevieve Stebbins published Dynamic Breathing and Harmonic Gymnastics in 1893, the year marked the arrival of Vedanta philosophy to the Western world at the World Parliament of Religions at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. With his publication of Raja Yoga in 1896, Vivekananda in the Ramakrishna tradition emphasized that bhakti, which is devotion, was more important to communing with the divine than any particular physical posture. Saint Denis was influenced by Vivekananda's the theory of Neo Vedanta. She taught yoga, breathing, and meditation at the Denison School and preached yogic doctrines to her students. The course of study of Denison, as dance scholar Jennifer of Brett shows, ties American modern dance to the philosophies of yoga theories from the Vivekananda tradition. In April 1919, 17-year-old Mark Graham was mesmerized by St. Denis's dance drama, Egypta. She met Theopor to see the Tamura or Paris dance, the Veil of Isis, the dance of day, incense, co cobras, Nodge, the yogi, and Radha. These were Graham's first exposures to a highly theatrical dance and St. Denis became her idol. In 1913, Graham joined the Kamnath School of Expression in Los Angeles, then enrolled in the Denison School in spring 1916, one year after its founding. Graham started teaching and living at Denison in 1918, and that was the same year when Theosophist Ananda Kintish Kumaras Swami published his seminal essay, The Dance of Shiva, about which I believe that uh, uh, the speaker was speaking about. Graham's Denison curriculum was included exoticized interpretations of Indian aesthetics brought in by St. Denis. In their respective biographies of Graham, both Ernest Stein Stoddle in 1984 and Agnes J. Mill in 1991 wrote about Graham's yoga practice. Stoddle wrote, under quote, in yoga classes, Martha had her first experience of bodily contact with the floor, end quote. And Agnes J. Mill affirms, under quote, were periods of mental discipline, end quote. Indian influenced training as taught at Denison was not totally erased by Martha Graham's late, later period in 1930, but, but instead she found a way to incorporate yoga by 1930. Carolyn Miller, Mark Wheeler, and Jennifer Albrecht all decry appropriation of yoga and Indian techniques by Graham. 
who they do not perceive as adequately acknowledging and valuing her predecessors. Though Miller attempts to explain the lack of acknowledgement of yogic knowledge, Aileen Orr does not view their intellectual effects on Graham as carrying over to Graham's movement practice. Albright shows concern for the undercoat labor of the yogis and yoga teachers end quote, of both St. Denis and Brahman. And she says that under court, such as Swami Vivekananda and Swami Parmananda, and she gives some other examples also, who strategically and selectively emphasized aspects of their yoga teaching to suit contemporaneous cultural trends and confront orientalist fantasies, end quote. Yet, these thinkers fail to acknowledge the positive impact of Indian yoga philosophies on Graham's technique, particularly on her approaches to energy and the female-centric narrative. If what Graham did in no way resembled Indian dance, mustn't we conclude that she used these influences to develop something new? I will now go on to explore the connection between Kundalini Yoga, energy, and the Graham contraction and release, and how they come together as a liberatory force for Graham's female characters. Graham knew about Kundalini Yoga from very early stages in her creative life. Her student Thelma Bera Free from the Eastman School reflects that her study with Graham under court was all quite revolutionary for upstate New York, end quote. Bera Free was quoted in uh, Neil Baldwin's recent uh, 2022 book. In his recent book, Baldwin writes that under court, Graham demanded that Steady sit cross-legged, close her eyes, and visualize the Kundalini serpent power coiling up her spine from the sacral plexus to the mainly tethered lotus crown at the top of her head and breathe deep in, a spiral going around and around. End quote. As per Caroline Miller, under quote, Kundalini is defined as a cosmic spiraling energy in every individual that exists at the base of the spine and through the practices of yoga travels upwards through the body and out and beyond the head through the sus susumna. This Sanskrit word Kundal means spiral, end quote, and susumna means main energy channel of the subtle body. During the 1930s, when Brahman is thought to have discarded the exotic trappings of the Denishan aesthetic, she nevertheless retained yoga in her own teaching and in the development of her training technique. Contraction and release are generally considered to be the cornerstone of Brahman's technical innovation in dance technique. They are far more dramatic and expressive than meditative. I take a step further in finding that the virile energy that defines Graham's early technique came from the same Indian philosophies that are also informed Indian pioneer dancer Rukmini Devi Arundel in the development of Bharatanatyam. According to both D. Reynolds and Mark Franco, Variety is a crucial part of Graham's approach to feminism in dance. In his discussion of Graham's formalism, Franco explains that, under quote, Graham was not a motivist precisely because she was feminist and purposefully avoided identification with the feminine as powerless, end quote. Not only does Graham resist portraying the feminine as weak, she indeed portrays it as powerful, 
drawing on Indian technique and narrative, including what Reynolds calls her virile rhythm. The breathing in her contraction and release is both a direct engagement with Indian technique and a use of female physical energy aggressive enough that it would typically be considered masculine. Graham was interested in percussive energies, which she calls masculinist and also nationalist within her modern framework. D. Reynolds discusses Graham's varied rhythm and empowering energies in her earthly technique up through 1938. After which, Graham would grow fascinated with the psychoanalytic theories of Carl Gustav Jung, which were strongly influenced by Indian ideas along, amongst the rest of his Eastern philosophy. Several decades earlier, Rukmini Devi Arundel had played a foundational role in reconstructing Bharatanatya, bringing together the rhythmic footwork of Sadi dance, which was performed only by male gurus, and the expressive dance performed by the Devadatis, which, is, which are the temple dancers. This combined dance vocabularies of masculine rhythm and feminine expression dovetails with Graham's ideas of rhythmic virility. Like Graham, Rukmini Devi was also female centric in the Indian context as she attempted to redeem the bismarck reputation of temple dancers had acquired under British colonialism. Dance scholar Uttara Asha Kullawala wrote on this context, noting under quote, Orientalist discourse and Christian dualist concepts of separating sensuality and spirituality generated the perception of exploited womanhood. End quote. Graham's friendship with Rukmini Devi Arundel is known to us from an unpublished manuscript of Devi's found in Graham's folder, Art Library of Congress, Washington, D.C., and from the chapter. Yoga, Art or Science, in a book titled Where Theosophy and Science Meet, a stimulus, a stimulus to Modern Thought, Volume 2. That was, the Volume 2 was published in 1951. It was first published in 1938. Rukmini Devi's involvement with the Theosophical Society had provided her several chances to travel abroad with her husband, George Orwell including to the U.S., where she gave speeches on Theosophy, Indian art, dance, and religion in 1938, 1948, and 1952. In her talk on the relationship of India and the West in 1952, she spoke about Kundalini theory as closely tied to Indian national identity. Devi had shared the manuscript with Graham the year prior, meaning before, before 1940s. But both of their dance modernities treat the spine as an instrument of power, connecting the human to the divine through application of posture and breathing. Kundalini Yoga was just as crucial to Rupini Devi in bringing out rhythm which means Tala, as a force to Graham in arriving at contraction and release as a percussive phenomenon. Just as Rukmini Devi's use of Kundalini Yoga ties it to Indian identity, Graham tied her own concept of rhythm to American national identity. Rhythm, Tala, was important to both of them in their notions of virility and dynamic energy. D. Reynolds reveals how Graham's pursuit of a masculinist aesthetic led her to a choreography of strength, power, and explosive energy, a modern response to, under quote, conventional notions of prettiness, end quote. In Graham's words, under quote, my first task is to teach them to admire strength, the virile gestures that are evocative of the only true beauty. 
I try to show them that ugliness may be actually beautiful if it cries out with the voice of power. End quote. Brown cited in no, dance scholar Reynolds book. This dynamism is at play in Graham's well-known contraction and release of the spine. Under quote, you have to let your breath forcibly out through your teeth and feel how the spine pushes upwards and strengthens and lengthens, contracts and then breathe in and see what your back do does as you stretch your spine upwards and release, end quote. This is Jane Dudley's 1997 interview with Henrika Bannerman, and they are also cited in Reynolds' book. Rukmini Devi echoes Graham in her use of the principle of Tara, traditionally practiced by male dance gurus, and Bhava, emotion associated with female temple dancers. And this I have referred from the dance scholar Avanti Meduri's book. Rukmini Devi learned of Tara from renowned male gurus Sri Minachi Sundaram Pillai and of Bhava from Mailapur Bhavi Amma. She articulates emotion of beauty and identity consistent with Brahm's remarks of amusing corporeal experiences to reach the ultimate self that Reynolds describes. In Rukmini Devi's words, in the training of the, of the body, in the molding of this movement into music made visible with music's life-giving gifts of beauty and rhythm, the physical matter which is body transcends itself as dance is the conquering of the body, so is music the conquering of the emotions. To transcend both is yoga. The sound that is physical calling to the eternal self in all. This shows that art is not a mere expression or an entertainment, but a power which, which can both destroy and build. So I move further to the uh, to the readings that Graham had been uh, reading about the yoga philosophies. So the Indian inspired thought that Graham quotes in her notebooks to gain a fuller picture of India as it existed in Graham's imagination and as it influenced her work in the 1940s through 1960s. This text seem to fall into one of two categories. They are either Western psychoanalytic studies right with Orientalist premises or India revivalist texts with nationalist agendas. These two genres meld in Graham's notebooks into a complex theory of India that is simultaneously Orientalist and insightful. Notebooks include references to Indian texts Rig Veda, Upanishads, Kundalini Yoga, and Tantra in context of Jung's psychology of consciousness and archetypes and the collective unconscious. <clears throat> Zimmer's Philosophies of India, Nakya Sastra from Kumaraswamy's book, The Mirror of Gesture, The Dance of Shiva, and The Transformation of Nature in Art. E.B. Havel's unpublished work, The History of Alien Rule in India, referred to by Zimmer and Campbell, Ideas of Indian Art by E.B. Havel, Santa Rama Rao's Home to India, and R.S. Pandit's Ritu Samhara, or the Pageant of the Seasons, translated from the original Sanskrit text of the century Sanskrit poet Karida. The notebooks of Martha Graham, 1973, bear out how Kundalini, the mythology of goddess Kali from the Sanskrit philosophies, and further Indian ideas integrated into her theory and practice. Despite their male describing Jung's ideas, Indian ideas as real Hindu, Jung scholars acknowledge that he was working with orientalized interpretations. 
Brahman seems to have seen true Jung in her own way, taking liberties with how she employed his theories and remaining open to a wide range of other thinkers from Ananda Kumar Swami to her own friends like Indian classical dancers such as Balas Saraswati or Shantarao. This would be a long-term cultivated interest of Graham both pre and post dating her visit to India during her 1955-56 Asian tour. A letter addressed to her near the end of the tour by L.W. Newstadter MRI from Santa Barbara showed grat gratitude for recommending he read Myths and Symbols in Indian Art, which was written by Kumar Swami. Over the following decade, Graham's technique and choreographic interests would take shape around the figure of the powerful workman taking on traditionally masculine postures into models, anti-patriarchal forms of femininity and beauty. As we know, this figure is heavily informed by Kundalini and Goddess Kali or Shakti, but the notebooks connect these sources directly to Jung. Under quote, the terrible mother, by recognizing the unconscious with its horror and fear and ugly strangeness, it can become a source of power and beauty. It can confer sovereignty, end quote. This is Graham in her notebooks. The vocabulary of the unconscious must be read as Jungian here, although Graham's readings of Kumaraswamy on knowledge and Havel on Indian art ideals formed a bridge seamlessly linking Jung to ancient Indian subject matter. In conclusion, we see the potential in studying the notebooks to identify how what started for Graham as a technical innovation based on yoga gradually developed into a dance theater form where the dramaturgy was equally influenced by Indian theater and philosophical currents within Indian performance. And this is all I want. I am presenting today and thank you so much for hearing and I hope you were able to hear me out and please feel free if you have any questions. Thank you. Can you please try? Yes. I can't hear. Uh, can you hear us? Still, still. Tracy, avec lui. Can. Can you? Is it? No, ça marche pas non plus. Can you hear us here? No. Okay. Bon, s'il y a des. I'm not able to hear. I'm sorry. Um. Bon, ce qu'on peut faire, c'est s'il y a des questions, on les transmet. Mais euh, s'il n'y a pas de questions, euh, où est-ce qu'il y, est qu y a des questions C'est un petit peu compliqué. Uh, can you write it down? Yeah. Um, um, ouais. um, My email ID, I think I know. Um, you can write me at you. 
suis vraiment désolée qu'on ait cette question technique. Après deux ans de Covid, on devrait être rodé, mais il euh, faut voir qu'on a perdu la main. On a perdu la main. Euh... Ok. Euh, et là, on va faire une petite pause. Alors... Euh... J'ai euh, appris, il y avait le... en fait, il n'y a pas de pause café de prévu, je suis désolée, il faut croire qu'il y a un truc un peu maudit cet après-midi. Par contre, il y a un pot à la fin de la journée, euh, mais, euh, mais là, il y a une pause d'une demi-heure, ce qui nous laisse le temps. Euh, on peut aussi, si ça vous va, non, la cafétéria est fermée, je crois que la cafétéria est fermée. Je vais essayer quand même de trouver une solution, on a une, on a une petite demi-heure euh, voilà, de pause et on va installer le reste, mais... Euh, voilà. Euh, je dis au revoir à Kakali et on peut se retrouver dans une. C'est 45, c'est affiché sur le programme. 45 pour, pour la suite. Merci. On va, on va reprendre. Avec les deux, les deux interventions pour... Euh... Oui, oui, oui. Non euh... Je, ouais, je vais aller Oops, au moins fermer. Alors, pour les, les, deux, les deux interventions qui, viennent, qui vont venir clore la journée, nous avons le plaisir de recevoir Phil Chan et Anne Colo. Euh, il va y avoir deux interventions et une forme de dialogue également. Euh, on va passer un petit peu d'une langue à l'autre aussi. Euh, je vais présenter Phil Chan et puis je vais, je, je vous, présente, je vais vous présenter tous les deux. Euh, voilà. euh, Phil Chan qui est chorégraphe et, euh, et auteur cofondateur de Final Bow for Yellow Face et auteur de l'ouvrage, du bah, qui est le même titre, Final Bow for Yellow Face, Dancing Between Intention and Impact. Il vient également de publier son second ouvrage, Banishing Orientalism, Dancing Between Exotic and Familiar, que je vous recommande euh, vivement. Il est euh, diplômé du Carlton College, ancien élève de la Ailey School, et il a été boursier de plusieurs universités, l'Université de New York, Madden School of Music, New York Public Library, l'Université de Harvard, et il est actuellement euh, chercheur invité en résidence à l'INHA pour un mois, et nous en sommes extrêmement euh, honorés et, euh, et heureux. Son travail de chorégraphe, d'auteur, se lie à un travail aussi euh, militant pour lutter contre les stéréotypes raciaux dans le ballet. Et euh, notamment euh, via l'association, l'organisation Final Bow for Yellow Face qui a été fondée euh, également avec Georgina Pascoe-Green, soliste du New York City Ballet. Avec cet engagement simple que je cite, euh, je les cite donc directement, « J'aime le ballet en tant que forme artistique et je reconnais que pour atteindre une diversité parmi nos artistes, nos publics, nos donateurs, nos étudiants, nos bénévoles et notre personnel, je m'engage à éliminer les stéréotypes désuets offensant des Asiatiques « yellow face » sur nos scènes. » Et euh, ce qui euh, nous interpelle particulièrement et dans le programme et dans sa résidence à l'INHA, c'est la manière dont euh, il arrive à articuler cette question euh, de euh, la réinvention, la reprise ou de euh, la questionnement de l'authenticité du ballet et de l'éthique et euh, des stéréotypes ou du renouvellement euh, dans le monde aujourd'hui euh, de, des ballets euh, sur lesquels il interroge aussi justement l'authenticité notamment du ballet classique. Euh, et il va intervenir autour d'un projet à Jacob Spilo, donc qu'il qu détaillera. Euh, Anne Colo est chorégraphe euh, également, euh, danseuse. Elle a mené un parcours d'interprète auprès de différents chorégraphes, euh, comme Philippe Découfflet notamment, et elle a rencontré euh, la cinématographie Laban, euh, dont elle est diplômée euh, en 1993, et ce qui l'a conduit à s'intéresser à la recréation à partir de partitions d'œuvres chorégraphiques du XXe siècle et à confoder le quatuor 
Knust, pardon, qui euh, s'est développé entre 1993 et 2001, un collectif d'interprètes qui a recréé plusieurs pièces emblématiques, dont la pièce mythique euh, de Nijinsky, l'après-midi d'un faune. Et, euh, alors je ne vais pas détailler sa longue, sa longue biographie, mais euh, elle euh, a mené euh, plusieurs, euh, plusieurs projets à partir notamment de, de 2001. Elle a participé à plusieurs projets chorégraphiques et elle a, euh, à ce moment-là, euh, fondé l'association Alters, ou, et Alters je sais, euh, qui articule dans ses projets recherche, pédagogie et création et axe son travail sur les utopies du collectif, thème qui l'incite à rencontrer la chorégraphe américaine Anna Alprin, pionnière de la danse postmoderne. Et elle débute un travail au long cours avec elle, et notamment avec euh, la réinterprétation in extenso de Parades and Changes, en dialogue avec Anna Alprin donc, et Morton Subotnik, euh, le compositeur et co-créateur de la pièce. En 2021, elle crée également comme une utopie son premier projet jeune public, euh, et j'étais aussi hein, le projet jeune public qu'elle vient de mener euh, le mois dernier, en résidence le, en, le mois dernier aussi à la Maison des, des Métallos. Et en 2019, Anne Colo revient à son intérêt pour les chorégraphes américaines novatrices et se plonge dans l'œuvre de Ruth Saint-Denis et Ted Schoen euh, et crée en 2019 Moving Alternatives, qui propose une réinterprétation critique d'œuvres des chorégraphes états-uniens, donc Ruth Saint-Denis et Ted Schoen. Et elle a bénéficié de l'aide à la recherche et aux écritures du Centre national de la danse pour prolonger ce projet scénique par la réalisation d'Alternative Bodies, une web série documentaire dont elle nous parlera tout à l'heure. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you very much to you both for being here and accepting to um, gather also your presentation with the discussion. Thank you. I'm going to use your microphone because I think I'm going to stand up today. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, apologies. Um, I've been in France for about two weeks and so. Um, I, I wish I could do this whole presentation in French, but I can still barely just order food in restaurants, so um, please forgive me for, for having to do this in English. Um, my expertise is not on Ruth St. Denis. Um, uh, it's really on Orientalism and dance. Um, but one of the things that I'm looking at is how Orientalism in general, so when we look at uh, the fantasy Asia in the Western performing arts, uh, it really is a way for us to innovate the art form. And so in what ways Uh, did Orientalism support innovation in dance? Um, I was lucky enough to have a research fellowship at Jacob's Pillow, so I was there in January, which is a very cold time to be at Jacob's Pillow. It is not very pleasant. Um, but it was a really unique opportunity to, to have some peace and quiet and to really look at um, the artifacts in the museum. Um, and we're putting together a, an exhibition for the Summers Festival, uh, which focuses on the Far East tour. So when Ruth St. Denis, Ted Sean, and the Denis Sean Company uh, first went to Asia, Uh, between 1925 and 1926. Um, so first of all, I wanted to show you these two portraits. Um, when you walk into Jacob's Pillow, this is like the first thing you see in the archives, and they're very, very big. So these two like cartoon iconographies as you walk in. And we have Ted Sean here dressed up as some sort of a Native American. Um, he also liked to not wear a lot of clothing. So this is a typical Ted Sean um, wearing little clothing outfit. And then here we have uh, Ruth St. Denis in one of her iconic roles as the Chinese goddess of Kuan Yin. Um, when you first walk in, it is actually quite a jarring experience to see these two pictures. Um, just to give you some background, I'm from Hong Kong, I'm Chinese. Um, and you could say that Kuan Yin is the closest thing I have to a personal patron saint. So she's like, uh, you know, when I have times of trouble, um, I will call on her to assist me. So to see this uh, white woman dressed as like my version of a saint, my patron saint, is slightly uncomfortable. Um, and it's sort of seen as this really important and legitimate uh, figure. So uh, on first glance, that is the first impression that, that one gets when, when you see these. And of course now, um, having a little bit more of a cultural awareness, Jacob's Pillow as an institution has put little, uh, little descriptions. They have a couple essays so that you can actually go and engage with these images um, in a more critical way. Um, but again, that doesn't sort of take away that first impact of, ooh, what are we looking at here, right? So I just wanted to, to give this as a starting point because this is what greets you when you walk into 
um, Jacob's Pillow in the archives. Um, this period, uh, you know, in the 1920s was a very interesting time in the world where there was a lot of global exchange, exchanges of ideas, and artists were asking a lot of these fundamental questions about how do we cross cultural boundaries, how do we see each, uh, each other better, but also how do we innovate, what is mo modern, how do we make something new with past traditions. Um, and I think Ruth St. Dennis and, and Ted Sean and their Dennis Sean company were really um, sort of one of these leaders uh, among many of the other figures that we've been discussing as part of the seminar of looking to the East uh, for inspiration and creative inspiration. Um, the Denishon Company really brings up some issues around integrity versus authenticity as well as appropriation versus appreciation. So how do we appreciate a culture without having this dynamic that feels like we're just taking things out of context or um, warping it through our own perspectives? As well as what does it mean to have integrity when you're presenting another culture? Um, and I think the, this debate between is it authentic um, doesn't always mean it has integrity. So some of the things that um, in my work as a scholar I'm constantly chewing on, um, and I think the Denishon Company is a really great um, way to see some of these ideas in motion. Um, so Ruth St. Dennis, Ted Sean, um, they came out of this lineage where um, by I think about 1906, they were they were pretty much at least Ruth St. Dennis has, had pretty much formed um, a brand for herself as this woman who was. Um, sort of showing off the different cultures of the world uh, through her own body and through her practice. Um, she was inspired by a cigarette ad, a, co a commercial for a, a poster for a cigarette with featuring the goddess Isis on it. And she thought, oh, that's a really cool image and I'd like to make a dance out of that, you know? Um, but what might have been different than some of her predecessors and, and other contemporaries at the time is, um, we see this long history in Europe of telling stories in the East. So we have things like Marie Taglioni uh, as an Indian woman in Bayadere. We see, of course, works like the Mikado, where we have, you know, um, the character's name is like Yum Yum and Beep po po Peep, and, um, and then, of course, characters like Ping Pang and Pong from Turandó. So not actually Asian characters, but really these fantasy um, oriental characters that, that uh, Western uh, artists were able to explore different themes, um, play with different stories, use this, uh, this cloak of Orientalism to do self-critique or to innovate in the art form. So a lot, of, a lot of these were not really Asian, but really instead Oriental. So I, I make a clear distinction in my work between Oriental, which is a Western fantasy of Asia, and actually Asian artists. So um, these, I would say, all fit under that, that first category of being Oriental, as opposed to Asian. Um, Ruth St. Dennis was a little bit different, though. Um, she possessed uh, a curiosity that um, really drove her artistic practice. So, okay, so the goddess Isis, right? She's, she's trying to be something specific from this culture. She's not just saying, well, I'm going to make up an imaginary name like Princess Gamzadi and pretend it's Indian, right? She, okay, so, so Isis, Kuan Yin, these real um, figures, icons in other cultures. She was a voracious reader. She went to the library. She, she really tried to do her research to see as much as she, and learn as much as she could about the cultures, the religions, and, and the different archetypes that she was trying to portray. So really coming from a place of um, curiosity, even though you have to remember, you know, in the early 20th century, travel was difficult. Um, resources were not as, as vast. I mean, we can now go on YouTube and find pretty much anything we want to see from anywhere around the world, you know, like Snow White's Magic Mirror. Whereas in at the early 20th century, that wasn't the case. It was often these, these ideas were informed by um, second or third person accounts, um, not primary sources and not actual authentic exposure to these cultures. So Ruth St. Dennis was taking a slightly different approach with how she approached these Asian cultures. Um, 
It's also worth noting what was happening with Asian dances and Asian performers at the time. Um, so this is a, an image of um, some Indian dancers at Coney Island in New York City. They were part of the sideshow at Coney Island. So you might go and you might see a bearded lady or a dwarf or all these different sort of f human freaks. And a alongside of that, you might see Asian people on display as well as Asian dances. Um, so that, that is really where the place of Asian dances were. Uh, with the, um, addition, the additional dynamic of colonialism, right? So when, looking at India, for example, when the British came in and ruined the sort of the social structure of where dances were supported, they were either supported in the royal courts or they were supported in the temples. And colonialism really eliminated those two structures of support for many of the Asian dancers. So um, there was a, a new uh, connection with Asian dances and sex work um, to the point where it was not really um, not really a good thing for to send our daughters into dance because that, that wasn't really a legitimate um, expression anymore. Um, and so combined with the fact that colonialism was really strangling a lot of these native dances and also just seeing Asian people and dances as this sort of curiosity was really the, the climate in which Ruth St. Dennis was starting to explore some of these themes. So she, again, wasn't trying to replicate this sort of fantasy orient, but instead was trying to ask, what is, what is the actual Asian culture and what do they look like? She, of course, created all of these dances within her, her own style, her own vocabulary, but still using this flavor. Um, and so here's, here's a couple images from some of her early dances. This is her uh, representation of the goddess Isis. I think it's sometimes called Egyptian dances um, from 1904. Uh, and then here we see uh, 1906, she, here she is in her one of her iconic pieces called Radha. You also notice that she has darkened her skin here, uh, a practice that she stopped doing later in her artistic practice. But in the early uh, Ruth St. Denis repertory, she did paint her skin to be try to be more Asian and to, to try to become a different race as she performed. Um, so Radha, this piece from 1906, um, sorry, this is sort of a blurry image, but uh, the piece itself was, uh, she's flanked by these four Indian men and she becomes, you see this, this sort of temple set and there's a beautiful video of it at Jacob's Pillow in the archives if you have a chance to visit. And essentially this goddess comes to life and she embodies the five senses. So she does a dance for taste, does a dance for touch, does a dance for smell. So really trying to create this um, really tactile experience of being Asian through the five senses. So that was what her Radha piece was about. Um, and it really, again, wasn't informed by authentic Indian dances. She probably had some references to visual clues that she emulated, but this was really sort of her own fantasy of what these dances could be. Um, wanted to show you a short clip of what we have of Radha. This is a, this, section was done about 35 years after she premiered the work. So this was done in the 40s. So she, as a performer, is also a much older woman in this video, but this is what we have as a record. So it's very short. So I just thought it'd be interesting to see it um, as, a, as a reference to see what this potentially could look like.
exhausting. Um, you'll notice that the music is also not Indian. It's uh, selections from Lakme. Um, she unfortunately had to use these sort of fake Hindu dances um, because she didn't actually have access to real Indian music. So she used the closest thing that she could could get, which was European composers making Oriental songs. So that was a particular excerpt from Lakme. Um, where did my slides go? Down here somewhere. So sorry, folks. There we go. Okay. Um, so themes that, that she was interested in, um, she was I I interested in the mysticism of Asia, um, sort of things that she could explore outside of a Judeo-Christian context, um, often working in particular symbols. So this is um, it's from a piece called The Cobras. Um, this is a headdress. I actually unpacked that out of a box uh, in January and got to handle that, which was pretty exciting. Um, you'll notice the, the difference between the actual object and the image itself. Um, in the picture, it looks like this beautiful, big, uh, ornate object. But then when you actually take a closer look at it, um, it's sort of just glued together. I, I, I refer to her work as dime store goddesses because she would go to the store and say, okay, I, do, I can't put real jewels like Kuan Yin's headdress, but here's little pieces of metal and little wires. And so whatever they could find, little knickknacks, baubles, buttons, um, you know, you take a closer look, it's literally like a woman's buttons from a shirt, from a garment that she's sewn together to look like you know, Chinese jewels, right? So um, upon closer inspection, it's really uh, the materials she used were quite cheap and accessible, but they were transformed into this sort of mythological, larger-than-life creations through her artistry. And, and costuming was a very important part of creating that magic and that flavor of the Orient. So this is one example of that. Um, here's another image of Kuan Yin, again, dressed as the Chinese goddess of mercy here. Uh, here she is in the peacock, um, the peacock dance. So again, taking this Indian idea, but then adding on this sort of exotic animal um, quality to it to, to create this sort of fantasy oriental dance. Um, now, when she started working with Ted Sean, um, one of the things they did was um, they had always wanted to go to Asia. They wanted to actually engage with authentic Asian dances and learn from these, these places. So in 1925, they were able to arrange, um, they called it the Far East Tour. Um, so from 1925 and 1926, they actually went to Asia. They were the first American dance company to travel to Asia. Um, and while they were there, um, they brought with them a mix of repertory. Some of it was, um, you know, their Greek and Roman repertory, you know, their, their, some of Ted Sean's more Western, American Western dances, but also some of their Oriental dances. And they were a little bit nervous about presenting some of these Oriental dances to actual Asian people. They weren't sure how it was going to land. But once they showed up, they realized, wow, there's so much that we can learn and also so much we can buy. So they, they went and they bought so many costumes. Everywhere they went, they would find authentic costume pieces. So Peking Opera pieces, um, authentic Peking Opera pieces are now found in Jacob's Pillow in their collection that were made in China as performance objects that then Ruth St. Dennis would buy and often embellish with her own, you know, make it even more uh, opulent um, than what, you know, the local audience would do from a performance perspective. So we have a lot of great photos of them traveling all over Asia. Um, Here's some images of Ted Sean dressed as the god Shiva um, doing some dances in an actual temple. And this, this kind of blurred the line between Oriental and Asian, right? So we have this um, European fantasy of Asia in a place that was sacred to Asian people. And so when you just look at it at face value, it's really easy to say they look the same, they look like they belong together, even though they're worlds apart. So this was sort of this blurring and this blending of Oriental and Asian that I think was both appealing and also perhaps confusing for many people. 
um, again, using this backdrop of Asia to set some of their dances. Um, while they were in these exotic places for them, they also really did learn. They studied with Japanese dance masters. Um, they went to see a lot of art, Peking opera, for example. Um, but then they would take what they saw, the, some of the vocabulary, and they would still spin it into their own dances. So they weren't trying to copy the dances. They weren't saying, okay, teach me a dance, and then I'm going to replicate it as a carbon copy. They might say, okay, here's some of these moves that I learned, and now I'm going to rearrange them and put them in and reinterpret them in my own personal style um, with these Asian costumes to create new works. So while they were on the road, they were not only learning, they were also making new oriental dances inspired by what they saw and the real cultural context they had with actual Asian people at the time. Um, so they went all over Asia, you know, China, Japan, um, Southeast Asia, and, and with them, um, we have some wonderful accounts from the Danishan dancers, some of their diaries um, about what they saw and then how they translated them into these dances. If you take a look at some of these costumes in the archives, um, they're also, again, this like, they feel very cheap or they're like sort of these fake costumes, but from a theatrical perspective, uh, it looks very much like what you might see in a, you know, like a traditional Asian dance. Um, if you sort of zoom out a little bit and kind of don't really look as clearly, for an uneducated Western audience, you might not even know the difference. Um, so talking about how do we share culture, what were the, the feelings of contemporary Asian people at that time? Um, so this is uh, an image of Mei Lan Fang. Um, he was a prolific Peking opera uh, performer. He was most famous for performing the Don roles, the female roles. Um, and so this is, this is him dressed as a, as a woman. Um, and then this is also, again, sorry for the blurry photo, but this is him with Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Sean, all each in their theatrical costumes. Um, Mei Lan um, Fang was also innovating Peking opera at the time, was, was also considered an innovator in Peking opera, bringing it into the 20th century. Um, and so there was a lot of dialogue happening between um, these artists about how do we change the form? How do we work within uh, a classical, uh, heritage, but also make something that is contemporary and then speaks to the moment. Um, and and with, with actually engaging with Asian artists, there was a great deal of respect and exchange. Um, artists like Mei Lan Fang really saw what Ruth St. Dennis was trying to accomplish with these dances and saw a way to almost make mainstream some of these dances that otherwise might be seen, again, as these like sideshow, lowbrow, kind of overly sexual, um, valueless dances. Um, so it, it's, it's hard to just, again, I'm, I'm bringing this up because it's not as black and white as being able to say, well, here's a white woman dressed as an Indian, it's cultural appropriation and it's wrong. Actually, in, in many ways, without Ruth St. Dennis performing these dances, she might not have been able, she opened the door for a lot of Asian performers to be legitimized. In fact, when she went to India, um, people were so excited to see Ruth St. Dennis performing these Indian dances, and it sort of freed Indian people of, of not uh, associating dance with these negative stereotypes, but instead seeing it as um, a professional career opportunity and as a way of legitimate cultural expression that might not have been possible without Ruth St. Dennis. So it's, it's a little bit complicated, right, when we think about these issues. So, so again, it's, it's very easy to just have that gut reaction like I had of, here's a white woman dressing in my culture. But looking at the context of the history, um, we see that, that you know, it's, it's not that simple. It's not that, that cut and dry. Um, I also wanted to show this other video clip of uh, Ruth St. Dennis doing a notch dance uh, later in her career. So after the Denishan Company came back to, to the West and they brought these dances with them, they were really trying to replace their previous Oriental dances with an expression of authentic Asian dances. So with new steps, new choreography, um, new ways of looking at the body. Unfortunately, the Western audiences saw these new dances and were kind of like, 
what, what is this? Like, give us the fantasy. This is, what is this garbage, right? And so, unfortunately, Ruth St. Dennis did revert back to going back into her oriental fantasy work as opposed to trying to um, become an actual Indian dancer, for example. Um, some of my friends who are, are Indian dance practitioners look at videos like this and they see traces of authentic Indian dance and they say, well, she, she's clearly a beginner. She, she has some things that are accurate, um, but it, it would sort of like me saying, well, I came to Paris, I went to the Paris Opera for a month, I learned how to do a tendu, and now I'm in a toile. And going around the world and saying I'm a, I'm a star of the Paris Opera, right, is sort of, sort of a similar dynamic there. So let's take a look at, at this dance, um, and maybe some of you who are more expert on Southeast Asian dances can see some authentic gestures, but also where it's not fully elevated as Indian dance. You know what? We have to do this. I'm so sorry, folks. Very short clip. Um, the end. Uh, okay, so this back to this idea of cultural appropriation. Um, so again, here's another image of Ruth St. Dennis in a piece called Omaki. Um, and at first glance, you might say again, okay, here's again this white woman committing cultural appropriation. But what if I told you that that kimono that she's wearing was a gift from the Japanese emperor? He gave her this kimono. Um, it's one of six kimonos she wore. She actually would stack them one on top of the other, so she's, she's probably wearing uh, quite a few garments there. She also embellished the garments, so she added layers at the bottom to make it more dramatic, more like a showpiece. Um, what if I also told you that this uh, image was, this photograph was taken by a Japanese American photographer? Right, so here was a Japanese photographer seeing a Japanese-ness in Ruth St. Dennis and wanting to capture her as a subject, right? So at face value, you could say cultural appropriation, right? But again, it's not that simple, right? It, at a different time, we, we saw a different way of crossing cultures. Um, Ruth St. Dennis also, to drive that curiosity, here is uh, another famous dancer, La Mary. Um, and this is actually heard in her in La Mary's Swan Lake. So she created a, uh, a, a Swan Lake, but using Indian dance, the same Tchaikovsky music, the same story, but creating essentially an Indian version of Swan Lake. Um, she was a, an anthropologist and she went around the world and she, she sort of specialized in world dances. Um, with La Mary, she founded uh, a school of Indian dance in New York City in 1940. So really trying to bring authentic Indian culture um, to the West. Um, alongside of this, as one of the founders of Jacob's Pillow and sort of the, the, the future, that we, what, we, what we now know as Jacob's Pillow, 
um, she started presenting actual Asian dancers. So not just Oriental dances, but Asian dancers. So um, part of my work uh, in January was also putting together a list of who was actually at Jacob's Pillow, who was invited to dance. Now in these early years, um, there was, they were still doing these Oriental dances. So we have Asian dancers performing alongside Oriental dances. So there was this blurring between fantasy and reality. Now, as Orientalism in modern dance and, and more broadly fell out of fashion, um, we start to see a rise in just Asian dances uh, devoid of their Oriental sort of counterparts. Um, and again, we see a commitment to presenting actual Asian artists at a time when it still wasn't mainstream, it still wasn't popular. So there is this long history um, of wanting to present actual Asian people, and that goes up until this very day. So Asianness has always been a part of the Jacob's Pillow legacy, um, which in many ways, a lot of these artists had doors open to them because of Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Sean and this curiosity about Asia. So again, um, you know, it, it would be nice if we could say these artists just were appreciated in their own right, but I think understanding that history, that we actually needed artists like Ruth St. Dennis, these white artists to embody Asianness, in order for Asian artists to be seen with legitimacy. And I think we see that both in Asia and in the West as well. So it's problematic, but that's, that's where, how we got to where we are today, where we can actually see a greater sense of equality, of equity, of giving the chance for Asian artists to be their own artists on their own terms. Um, so it is a part of our evolution towards greater equality, um, despite the fact that it's sometimes a little uncomfortable as well. So I think that is also a part of my work is um, being able to say this is beautiful, and a little bit racist. It can be both things at the same time. Sometimes we're conditioned that you know racist is bad and not racist is good, and that those two things can't go together. But um, I think as scholars, we have to be uh, okay in this discomfort that something might not be um, might not have integrity, but can also still be beautiful. Um, and I just wanted to include this. Um, this is me on my hands and knees with Ruth St. Dennis's kimono in the archives uh, in January. And it's just, it was such a treat to be able to get up close and actually touch um, these pieces and handle them. So uh, this show that we're, we're putting together is uh, a costume show that is exploring this Far East tour and how the Dennis Sean artistic practice changed as a result of the Far East tour, but also how it opened doors for Asian artists in the future as well. So thank you, short and sweet. And I'll, I'll pass it over to, to Anne and we can talk about it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, very much, Phil, for this uh, very rich and brilliant presentation. Um, so I don't have any PowerPoint because I will uh, share with you one episode of an uh, um, online of a web documentary series. I uh, realized, thanks to the support of the... It's true I could speak in French, d'ailleurs, but... OK, I could maybe speak in French, sorry, Phil. All good. Um, I realized thanks to the support of the Centre National de la Danse in a une, une bourse called Aide à l'écriture et à... à la recherche et à l'écriture ou à l'écriture au patrimoine, je ne sais plus, parce qu'elle a changé de nom euh, au cours des années, et qui m'a permis de, de recueillir, en fait, les, les points de vue d'un certain nombre d'interprètes euh, danseurs avec qui j'avais créé en 2019 une pièce qui s'intitule « Moving Alternatives » et dans laquelle je, je recrée des pièces de Ruth Saint-Denis, donc des solos indiens, enfin d'inspiration indienne, on va dire. Euh, il y a trois solis d'inspiration indienne qui sont euh, « Incense » qui date de 1906, euh, Cashmere Notch qui date de 1919 et Lazy Notch qui date de 1917. Euh, et ces solos, je les ai recréés, ces solis, je les ai recréés grâce à des partitions écrites en cinétographie Laban euh, que j'ai trouvées au Dance Notation Bureau de New York. 
Et c'est donc c'est à travers cette, euh, cette transcription en notation Laban qui a été réalisée euh, à partir de l'interprétation d'une des danseuses de la compagnie de Ruth Saint-Denis, mais dans les années 80. Donc il y a déjà tout un, euh, toute une distance, euh, bien sûr, qui se, qui se produit par rapport à la réinterprétation que, que j'en propose avec les danseurs de Moving Alternatives. Et euh, il y a également dans cette pièce des extraits de, de pièces de Ted Schoen, donc plus tardives, euh, euh, The Dome, donc, qui date de 1932, et Kinetic Molpai, qui date de 1935, et qui sont des pièces de groupe euh, entièrement masculines. Et en fait, par rapport à cette réinterprétation, je m'intéressais à qu'est-ce qui avait précédé en fait, le, le courant euh, de la postmodernité euh, en danse euh, états-unienne notamment Anna Alprine et comment la Californie avait été une terre d'utopie. Et euh, Ruth and Denis et Ted Show ont commencé à travailler en, en Californie. Et, et en s'intéressant à ces, à ces précurseurs considérés comme des pionniers de la danse moderne américaine, euh, dite américaine, je me suis aperçue en fait que réinterpréter ces danses aujourd'hui posait une multitude de questions et qu'il fallait absolument, dans une pièce chorégraphique, euh, proposer un dispositif de regard qui permettent de problématiser euh, ces danses. On ne pouvait pas juste les présenter aujourd'hui comme ça sans avoir ce, ce dispositif. Et j'ai décidé de, donc de, de proposer ces réinterprétations avec une équipe vraiment multiculturelle d'interprètes qui étaient tous concernés à différents registres par ces questions euh, euh, d'emprunt culturel, d'identité, de, d'appropriation culturelle, de genre pour qu'ils portent aussi que leur, euh, leur parcours, leur ressenti soit euh, qu'ils mènent l'enquête avec moi en fait, quels sont les effets des danses de ce début du siècle sur des euh, corps contemporains euh, les effets de ces gestes du passé aujourd'hui et la pièce Moving Alternatives que vous allez, dont vous allez voir des extraits dans cet épisode documentaire et c'est vraiment c'est presque devenu une agora en fait dans laquelle ces danseurs et ces danseuses euh, expriment un certain nombre de points de vue et comme ça a été très riche les discussions qui ont eu lieu autour de cette pièce pendant la, le processus de création euh, j'ai eu le désir de documenter, de recueillir ces, ces points de vue mais de les documenter aussi avec les points de vue d'un ensemble de chercheuses et de chercheurs qui avait euh, nourri en fait la création et c'est un certain nombre de ces chercheurs que vous allez voir dans cet épisode donc il s'agit de l'épisode 3, il y a 5 épisodes qui vont bientôt être en ligne euh, qu'on qui, qu vient de finir avec Jacob Fner qui est le vidéaste avec lequel j'ai réalisé cette, euh, ce documentaire et euh, on a réalisé euh, donc 10 entre 16 entretiens au total avec les interprètes et avec les chercheurs et après euh, j'ai tissé tous ces entretiens avec des documents d'archives, des extraits du spectacle de Moving Alternatives donc l'épisode 3 que, que j'ai été invité à présenter aujourd'hui s'intéresse plus, plus particulièrement à la notion d'exotisme et euh, comment ça, cette notion d'exotisme traverse euh, le travail bien sûr de Rose Saint-Denis et en quoi on peut y amener un regard euh, critique et euh, contemporain. Voilà, donc je ne sais pas si... Ah, thank you on va faire uh, so, uh, je, je dis en anglais uh, um, so if it's okay we'll look at the documentary and then we'll have a joint discussion regarding uh, Ruth Sandy and Tetron and opening to the audience <laughs> Le désir de cette série documentaire est né à la suite du spectacle Moving Alternatives que je crée en 2019 avec une formidable équipe de performeuses et de performeurs. Dans ce spectacle, nous recréons, à partir du système d'écriture du mouvement de Rudolf Laban et de films d'archives, des danses de deux chorégraphes états-uniens, Ruth Saint-Denis et Ted Schoen. Considérés comme les précurseurs au début du XXe siècle de la danse moderne nord-américaine, elle et il furent les premiers à s'intéresser aux danses extra-occidentales et à épuiser abondamment pour nourrir leur conception d'une nouvelle danse. Les danses que ce couple a créées, les représentations qu'elle et il ont inventées, me posent tellement de questions aujourd'hui 
sur la manière dont on représente l'autre, les autres, sur les notions de culture et de genre que j'ai eu envie de continuer l'enquête. Avec les interprètes du spectacle qui ont incarné ces gestes venus du passé et fait de leur danse un outil d'investigation sensible, mais aussi avec un ensemble de chercheuses et de chercheurs en histoire de la danse, en esthétique, en philosophie, en anthropologie, en gender, cultural ou postcolonial studies. Elle et il vont nous aider à cheminer au milieu de ces interrogations. Dans ce troisième épisode, nous demanderons si les danses de Ruth Saint-Denis sont une performance de l'exotisme et ce que ce mot « exotisme » porte comme charge historique et politique. So in many ways, I had to try to go into my own fantasy of what she, how she may have thought. Well, I think she created a whole world because if you look at the images, I mean, first of all, she always had those huge skirts and she had those accessories and she had like the, the different um, things that made noise and she created the accomplices that are sitting next to her and, and, she, and she brought It's not just the gestures, it's the music. It's, she really created this kind of temple around her. When I think the one just I think about is this one where we do this, this, this kind of thing. And um, I had to ask myself, what is it that I'm looking for? Is this, is this a sun? Am I, and also there's all of this uh, turning and this kind of idea of look at me, don't look at me. Or this kind of, uh, it, it was something about being being the object of desire but, uh, and loving it somehow, but at the same time uh, feigning or performing a sense of uh, shyness, discretion or something like that. But I remember you, were, you, you gave direction in my process of learning of saying like, yeah, can we evoke these, this, this corpse? You know, even though it's based on uh, uh, and the objectivization of brown bodies, in essence. That's what I think we would say with an American polemic. They are exotic objects to define her bohemian singularity. Oriental objects at the service of her free spirit. Her artistic vibrancy sucks their splendor, their regalia. All to guarantee a thrill of danger, just a little bit, not too much now, in order to evoke a perfume of elsewhere, of otherness, whatever that may be. These men, Muslim, Hindu, students, laborers, in any case, dark in flesh. These holy men, unmoving on the stage, a human screen dehumanized for the pearly goddess 
who considers them nothing but boys, 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 etc. It, it, it's very distressing to us today to think of this um, sort of employment of, of South Asian uh, laborers, in some cases, if I recall correctly, as, as you say, living stage sets to bring, quote, authenticity to this uh, rendition of the Orientalist imaginary. So there you have that kind of anchoring in, in the bodies of these, uh, these uh, workers who were hired, uh, not as dancers, but uh, really the, sort of as, as living um, props, we might say. And of course, we find this, um, you know, today we find this sort of shocking and, and uh, offensive. And we have, we have a vocabulary now to talk about what that is and how it was, uh, how it was working. Elle est au cœur de cette construction de ce qui est l'exotique, ce qui est l'autre, ce qui est le, ce qui n'est pas moi. Après, après, encore, je ne sais pas si elle, si elle avait une idée de qu'est-ce que ça deviendrait quand elle a eu cette, cet appel intérieur. Ou en tout cas, quand elle a décidé que ce serait sa démarche à elle. I know that this was a, a whole other era, and we have to also consider the context which you talked about. You know, this, the, the role of Orientalism, the role of exoticism that touched clearly the commercial world, but also the experimental artistic world at the time. We can't necessarily escape it. It is by no means uh, my way of um, giving Ruth an excuse or trying to be an apologist for her. But I do think it's a complicated question around uh, how we as artists are inspired, where do we draw inspiration from, and I think importantly, what is it we do in treating it? Et c'est ça qui est passionnant dans ce projet, c'est comment on regarde euh, cette danse, comment on regarde cet exotisme, comment on met euh, en scène ça pour, pour justement pointer le. Euh, les aspects problématiques. Aujourd'hui, on ne parlerait plus de danse exotique. Ou alors, si on en parle, c'est peut-être justement, c'est un peu péjoratif. Mais dans la période que j'ai étudiée, donc fin du 19e siècle, 1940, c'est en parcourant justement les différentes archives que je me suis rendu compte que les gens parlaient de danse exotique. Cette formule revenait systématiquement dès lors qu'on parlait de danse d'ailleurs. On employait ce terme exotique. Et donc, de la période de la fin du 19e siècle jusqu'aux années 40, ce terme-là signifiait deux choses. Danse exotique signifiait à la fois une danse venue d'ailleurs, mais on ne savait pas trop de quel ailleurs. Par exemple, euh, un danseur japonais euh, ou un danseur indien, on ne faisait pas forcément euh, la différence, c'était l'Orient, c'était un danseur oriental. Et ça, c'est fidèle à l'étymologie du terme exotique, c'est euh, qui est à l'extérieur de moi. Mais à cela se rajoutait une deuxième notion qui est celle d'étrangeté. C'est-à-dire que la danse exotique, c'était non seulement celle qui vient de loin, mais c'est aussi celle qui est étrange. Qui est étrange parce que ça ne fonctionne pas selon les codes et les usages du corps dansant que l'on avait jusque dans les années 1880. Notamment dans les lignes du corps, notamment dans les usages du costume, notamment dans la façon d'utiliser le, le visage. Un exotique, on utilisait la forme substantive, un exotique, c'était un étranger, c'était un synonyme pour dire étranger, mais pas n'importe quel étranger. 
un étranger venu de certaines contrées, donc oui, dans les années 30, en pleine apogée euh, du colonialisme, euh, un exotique, c'était quelqu'un qui appartenait au territoire colonisé par les, les puissances impérialistes européennes. Coney Island, c'est quoi C'est un grand parc d'attractions au sein duquel l'attraction principale est le village hindou. Et le village hindou, qu'est-ce que c'est Bon, rappelez-vous, nous sommes en pleine période coloniale. Le village hindou, c'est ce qu'on pourrait appeler aujourd'hui un zoo humain. Tous ces spectacles, ces grandes mises en scène sont issus de la lignée des représentations exotisantes de ces savants anglais qui créent le mythe cliché de l'Orient. Un Orient illusoire, euh, imagé. Donc, Ruth Sardanis est le pur produit de son époque. I have another information about the uh, Hindu village, you know, the, what was called the Hindu village in Coney Island. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was a book by Prasna Purkaskaya, where she mentions a Hindu village in London in an exhibition in the palace, the glass palace. And that was a big exhibition hall for showing Uh, the British people, the power of the empire. And so all these little local villages from different parts of the empire were assembled there. Um, and the, it was a very complete research because they had the list of names of the dancers. There were dancers and there was a snake charmer and there was a juggler and there were other people. Um, and the two dancers were billed as mother and daughter but they were from different parts of India. So you can see they were not very accurate about what they were showing. So if the Coney Island village was something like that village, it might not have been totally accurate in terms of uh, anthropological explanations of what was being shown. Yeah. Mm, yes, it, it was a mise en scène, a staging for the. That, absolutely. That's exactly the word. Mise en scène, yeah. What about the dances she might have seen? So, if these two dancers were from two different parts of India, they would have been doing Kathak and Bharatanatyam or something completely different. So, they must have had to work together to produce something. So, we can only imagine what they might have done. Maybe some folk dance. They must have been good at the time when they were selected, otherwise they wouldn't have been selected. But dance today is much faster, much more presentational, much more complicated than it was at that time. Il est clair que dans l'espace des expositions universelles et coloniales, il y a la volonté de faire passer un discours, qui est un discours colonialiste, qui est un discours impérialiste. Donc effectivement, le spectacle exotique va servir ce discours. This type of deployment. Uh, and framing of, uh, you know, a, 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 a vision into a so-called uh, exotic world, that right to look, the presumption of the right to look, uh, was something that she very much was bringing right onto the, the stage there with her in a way that was certainly not solely her. It was broadly authorized in these um, often state-sponsored Uh, institutions as well. Dans les music halls et dans les grandes revues de music halls, effectivement, on recrutait des artistes dits exotiques pour créer des tableaux qui n'étaient que la représentation d'un imaginaire de l'autre. Ce qui motive le spectateur à aller voir les danseuses exotiques, c'est le dépaysement, c'est la griserie de l'ailleurs, c'est le fait de voyager en prenant juste un métro et en prenant juste le, le bus ou le métro pour aller, pour aller au théâtre. Oui, il y a des, ces discours-là qui ont mis en scène l'autre, à partir de stéréotypes euh, très liés au discours euh, colonialiste. Et, et en même temps, eh bien, il y avait des démarches euh, de découvertes, de rencontres, évidemment et immanquablement euh, prises dans le filtre 
de ces, de ces imaginaires-là, euh, avec néanmoins euh, une interrogation, une volonté d'en savoir plus. C'est ce qui va faire qu'on va avoir dans, à partir des années 20 des danseurs français qui vont euh, profiter du passage de, des danseurs venus d'ailleurs pour aller les interroger, pour aller les interviewer, pour prendre des cours avec eux. La figure de la danseuse exotique, pour moi, elle apparaît avec Matahari en 1905, lorsque cette... Euh, jeune femme hollandaise qui n'a jamais appris la danse, euh, mais qui a vécu euh, aux Indes, comme on disait à l'époque, vient et propose des... Se, se fait passer pour une danse aux hindous et arrive à berner euh, Monsieur Guimet pour euh, faire un spectacle prétendument euh, de danse hindoue. Elle devient euh, extrêmement célèbre avec ensuite la, la destinée qu'on qu lui connaît. Et elle est à l'origine justement à la fois d'un type de numéro de spectacle qu'on va retrouver jusqu'à la fin des années 30 et d'un type de personnage qu'on va retrouver aussi dans le musical jusqu'à la fin des années 30. Donc ce personnage, c'est une danseuse venue d'ailleurs, fascinante, séduisante, euh, très érotique, qui, à travers sa danse, manifeste à la fois l'énigme de son altérité, mais aussi suggère euh, une sensualité qui n'est plus accessible, euh, euh, qui ne serait plus accessible en Europe. Et ce qui a été une stupéfaction, une découverte pour moi, c'est de m'apercevoir que une danseuse dont j'avais lu le nom en parcourant les histoires de la danse et que j'avais totalement identifiée comme étant la pionnière de la danse moderne occidentale, à savoir Rue de Saint-Denis, et bien que Rue de Saint-Denis avait fait quelque chose de tout à fait similaire à ce qu'avait fait Matari en 1905, puisqu'en 1906, elle se produit dans un théâtre à Paris, avec un numéro qui reproduit euh, à quelque chose près le numéro de Matari. Et la mise en perspective de ces deux figures m'a invité à me dire, mais il y a peut-être quelque chose à revisiter, à revoir dans la manière dont on a construit nous-mêmes l'histoire de cette danse dite moderne, pour mettre en évidence que finalement, bah peut-être que Rue Saint-Denis, elle est apparue à un moment où, où il y avait cela, c'est-à-dire qu'elle est aussi le produit d'un contexte, et en ce sens-là, elle est moins une pionnière que euh, euh, le produit. objets euh, artistiques euh, parce que euh, il relaient des pensées et des images euh, qui sont euh, euh, malsaines dans le sens où euh, il crée une relation à l'autre euh, qui est euh, complètement déséquilibrée et euh, voilà et il y a une, une désexploitation euh, voilà, de l'autre, de l'étranger. Après, euh, je pense que la toxicité, elle n'est pas que dans l'œuvre, elle est aussi dans le, elle peut être dans le regard de celui qui regarde, hein, de celui qui reçoit. Enfin, elle est tellement partout la toxicité, je trouve, euh, et encore plus, euh, voilà, nous dans l'environnement dans lequel euh, on évolue aujourd'hui, <rire> voilà, dans ce qu'on nous dit, euh, dans ce qu'on perçoit, dans euh, euh, voilà la relation qu'on peut avoir à l'histoire, euh, aux histoires, euh, voilà, dans euh, des gens euh, qui ont le droit de parler ou qui ont l'espace pour parler. J'avais le ressenti, euh, moi, pendant tout le long, d'un effort 
énorme euh, de la part de la chorégraphe, en tout cas de la part de la personne qui était responsable de tout ça, n'est-ce pas, qui est toi, de déconstruire quelque chose. Euh, un, un, un vrai effort, en fait, c'est dire qu'est-ce qu'on fait maintenant avec euh, ce qui, ce qui j'ai reçu en termes d'héritage culturel, n'est-ce pas, parce que ça fait partie de ton héritage culturel en tant que qu'occidental et euh, et je me suis dit, c'est intéressant d'entamer de, de, ces dialogues. Parce qu'il euh, faut que ces dialogues se mettent en place. C'est-à-dire comment on déconstruit effectivement aujourd'hui ces images et comment on déconstruit d'une façon active, sans être à la fois dans le, la repentance, en se disant, euh, oh, ça se passe bien, on ne va pas le faire, mais au contraire, en se disant, on va peut-être le réjouer à nouveau. Et on va essayer de faire en sorte que ces images-là nous disent quelque chose. Dans le, tra le travail que tu as fait pour la pièce, il y, y a un risque, euh, je dirais, euh, objectif, c'est euh, la puissance de fascination de ces danses. Moi, je t'avoue, quand je vois, avant de voir l'archive, si je ne regarde pas l'archive, je regarde les danses, tu as des interprètes qui sont euh, élégants, beaux, c'est des danses qui sont une dextérité, qui ont un côté quand même assez fascinant. Donc, elles continuent à agir de leur puissance. Du coup, on est en face de quelque chose qui nous montre où est le problème. C'est-à-dire qu'en fait, ce serait facile d'avoir des espèces d'objets de, assez laids du passé, qu'on viendrait montrer comme des, comme des monstres. Et moi, ça j'appelle ça l'effet épouvantail. Et je trouve que c'est plus facile et plus dangereux que, que, de, que de concéder la fascination. Lors du cadre de, de, de la présentation de ton spectacle, j'étais en train de faire une médiation décoloniale, n'est-ce pas Déjà par le terme décolonial, décoloniaux, euh, on, on entend déjà un processus politique de décolonisation des imaginaires. Ça n'est pas tout simplement de l'ordre justement des concepts, euh, euh, etc. On parle vraiment des, des modes de vie. Parce que la question de la racialisation, elle, est en train, elle articule nos relations sociales. On se rend compte qu'il suffit juste qu'on essaye de contester ou même voir aborder ces sujets pour voir les tensions ressurgir. Euh, ça montre à quel point euh, cet ordre-là est établi quelque part et comment ça dérange en fait le fait qu'on qu aille disons, fouiller, n'est-ce pas, euh, sur ces genres de, de, ces, ces, ces genres de terrain. Et euh, donc ça montre euh, l'importance euh, de, de le faire et, euh, et, et comment le chemin de la déconstruction, il est encore grand. En tant que racisé, je pense qu'en l'occurrence, même ce terme, il, il dérange beaucoup de monde. Parce que les gens, ils disent « Ah, mais en tant que racisé, vous êtes en train de vous victimiser, etc. » Mais on se dit, mais non, ce que nous sommes en train de faire, c'est de vous montrer que vos processus de racialisation historique agissent encore aujourd'hui sur nos corps. Ça n'est pas quelque chose de l'ordre du passé. Ça n'est pas fini avec les indépendances. Il euh, y a une colonialité qui opère et euh, qui vient jusqu'à aujourd'hui faire en sorte qu'on ait moins d'accès, l'opportunité d'accès ou, ou même des opportunités de travail, logement, etc. On n'a pas envie de rester dans un lieu figé du passé et de se dire effectivement, ah, donc on est victime. Personne ne va être victime des processus de racialisation. Tout le monde est fatigué de cette histoire. Mais on a besoin d'une reconnaissance pour pouvoir progresser ensemble et de pouvoir apaiser en fait ces histoires et ces mémoires et développer un récit commun dans lequel on est tous des êtres humains, effectivement. Et là, en l'occurrence, on parlera d'échanges, de cultures, de rencontres et pas d'appropriation culturelle. <rire> Pour peut-être aussi boucler la boucle des formes, je pense qu'après, qu'est-ce qui manque comme dernière présence avec nous ben, C'est la critique non occidentale. Ce qui nous manque, c'est ça. Ce qui manque, c'est des gens capables d'écrire sur le point de vue que je viens de te dire. Si tu as un papier sur une pièce d'un critique euh, brésilien, africain, indien, que sais-je, qui d'un coup voit autre chose et peut voir des limites aussi, mais voit aussi des possibilités, et bien là, ça change à mon avis. Donc pour moi, le travail en art n'est pas dissociable en fait de la production critique, qui est en voie de disparition, mais qui nous manque cruellement pour faire des opérations 
qui, si elle était par la critique, n'aurait pas besoin de les faire en son travail. Tu dirais, moi, je fais mon travail, et après, le critique, ou la critique, regarde, et dit, c'est vrai que là, je vois une, une chose qui est peut-être, mais, mais qui est là. Tandis que là, on reste à le problème de, de, de champ de, de l'art aujourd'hui, c'est qu que c'est une critique blanche, encore une fois, du monde entier. Et donc, en ayant travaillé, moi, avec des alliés racisés, euh, voilà, Mandurik Digoun, qui dirige sa vie à Berlin, euh, Anthony Jacques, qui s'occupe de la rue Chimuranga, etc., on se rend bien compte qu'on arrive à écrire des trucs différents dès lors que c'est produit par des espaces, des géographies différentes. Et se permettre d'instruire une critique située et racisée est pour moi le, le morceau qui nous manque pour que ça marche, cette histoire-là. Parce que tant que le regard sur les œuvres sera un regard blanc, tu auras toujours l'impression qu'il faut dire des choses pour ce regard blanc. C'est ce travail-là que je veux faire. Je me dis, il y a un endroit où il faut travailler, il faut que des gens voient complètement autrement des formes et disent non, 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 non. Moi, en fait, depuis mon regard, ce que je vois, c'est ça. Je laisse juste les mentions parce que c'est important. Que... Merci beaucoup à tous les deux. Thank you very much to you um, both. Um, I think you both have like very distinctive points of views on um, this moment and this works, but that resonate together. Um, thank you also uh, very much. Feel like to go back to the previous interventions. Like the the list you shown was extremely interesting and striking and and showing the legacy that brought Rutsani and and the history of Jacob Spiel. I think that was quite fascinating. Um, je vais pas parler plus longtemps. Est-ce que vous voulez c'est ouvert? Est-ce qu'on on ouvre tout de suite peut-être euh, la parole au? On peut ouvrir à la salle tout de suite. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions? C'est pas encore accessible en ligne, mais ça le sera très bientôt, very soon. Thank you very much, um, Phil. I have a question for you um, because I'm extremely interested in your uh, distinction between Asianness and Asian dancers and Oriental dancers. And in the morning, we had this panel about Newton Yorker's oeuvre, and I couldn't say if actually. <laughs> Uh, it's more about the blending you mentioned and this, this sort of uh, complexity which is really uh, striking and makes us as re researchers think a lot about uh, yet definitions, uh, canon, um, etc. So it's just what came to my mind after listening uh, to you that this is re rather complicated too, the Asian dancers and the Oriental da uh, dancers and, and, and this constant oscillation uh, and circulation uh, of, of these uh, formulas we have in, in, in modernity. <laughs> it was more a comment, but it was really fascinating. Thank you so much for Thank your you. talk, but it gives us a thought-provoking <laughs> Um, yeah, it's I, I, thought provoking. Yeah, even I just uh, worked on a piece called the Ballet de Porcelaine, which is uh, originally from 1739. It was a Baroque ballet, um, and it was about Asian people. But as an Asian choreographer, I didn't see it as a Oriental dance. I wanted to make 
bring in my own Asian heritage. So I do have some classical Chinese dance background. So I mixed, um, and actually in this case, Baroque dance was the exotic dance for me, uh, even though I'm a classical ballet dancer. Uh, so I, I could, you know, I, I had some awareness of Baroque dance. Um, for me, that was the exotic. So I was b blending my Chinese classical dance, which I learned in China is authentic, and this Baroque dance, which I was privileged enough to study with Patricia Beeman, who's a, a Baroque dance scholar herself, um, and then also blending it with my own unique choreographic voice as an artist in the way that Anne did with, she's, she's making her own work as well. This is her choreographic voice. So I'm blending Asian, fantasy oriental as Baroque and my own voice, three mixed together um, to make one new work um, or a new, way of approaching it so it it, it does get messy um, but mm. when you when you look at it you just see a dance and you might see oh that's a, a gesture from classical Chinese dance or oh that's the way a Baroque person would hold their arms or their body um, but it's like remixed so much that it's just you know now it's all one one thing I don't know I think about it like Italian cooking you know maybe it's like three ingredients that are very strong individually and it's you pair them in a way that you know emphasizes each other so absolutely thank you thank you oh sorry <laughs> okay just a very short curiosity question before maybe I will leave earlier because I have my train to get and I so I also use this opportunity to thank everyone once again. Uh, my little question is that, do you know which country exactly did uh, Ted Schoen and Ruth Tenderney visit it in Southeast Asia? I'm referring, of course, especially to the picture with the pointed headdress, which could evoke Cambodia or Thailand Siam. Yeah. So I'm, I've been curious for a long time about this detail, and I wonder if you had some information. I know for sure they went to Siam. I don't okay. know what other, uh, and, I, and maybe even Vietnam, I'm not sure, you know, but, but I think that's something that we can easily do a quick Google search and, okay. and find out. But they definitely went okay. to That's Thailand. what I guess, but I just wanted yes. to be sure from your point of view because yes. you did much more research. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, in the in the also the Doris Humphrey archives at the NYPL at the New York Public Library, there's like the series of postcards that she got during the tour. So it's interesting, and there's even like notes behind the postcards, like, and so that's a, also quite fascinating. Like during the the tour they had in the Far East with like uh, um, Doris Humphrey's notes and and the postcards. a book of Ted Schwann about uh, their trip to Asia and also they went to Spain too and I don't remember now I read it but a while ago if if, if there is a chapter specifically about Cambodia but you can look yes. at this you yeah. don't think so and and also there is this uh, journal of Doris Humphrey who also talk about this tour in Asia so maybe you can have yes. some information there and too. Yes, uh, but, uh, Ruth Thunderlin's biography is detailing all the countries, and I, I've read it, but I can't remember exactly which, uh, which country they went to, but it was a, a huge tour, and I know they went to, also to India, of course, and they performed, I think, like more than 100 performances there. And you were talking about the reception uh, in India, and that was uh, super interesting. There is a, one of the scholars I interviewed, uh, Asha Korlawala, uh, wrote a fascinating article uh, about the question of reception of these dances in India, and you can find it, I think, online. And she's just un unfolding all the layers of uh, the different issues, and it's very... Uh, I mean, in the same audience, you had like some uh, uh, rich people or, comment on dit, des notables who who had a certain interpretation. You had poor people who were just enjoying the fact to see a white woman wearing, and that's what uh, uh, Carla Walla told me. She that was so, so, such a fascination for them because actually she was an. Uh, 
undressing, a kind of uh, performing a kind of striptease, actually, and they were they've never seen that on stage. So there there were multiple uh, multiple layers. Oui, qu'est-ce qu'on appelle le malentendu culturel, qui sont souvent créatives, mais qui sont, <laughs> sont toujours des malentendus aussi. Uh, yes, thank you so much for your presentation. So, of course, uh, today we are to talk uh, a lot about uh, this uh, appropriation uh, notion, but it's uh, also problematic because uh, the problem that uh, if we take this uh, um, questioning till the extreme, we create also some sort of a ghettization. I don't know if I can say un ghettisation, uh, because uh, finally, what is, I think is risky, and is risky for everybody, of course, it's uh, that uh, only, we can perform only if we belong to uh, this, uh, this country, and uh, we can't do it. And uh, this is very, very dangerous. Yeah, it's resegregation. I mean, as an anthropologist yeah. and a uh, dance historian, I think it's very dangerous because uh, uh, there was uh, this discussion we had in India, for instance, because uh, uh, some of the most, the most uh, I mean, I'd say excellent dancers for India, Indian dancers are uh, not only from the West, but uh, from uh, Malaysia, Chinese origin, and uh, also from uh, Japan. And there is this question, they are Asiatic also, but they are not Indian. So there is a lot of like, uh, yeah, and this is very complicated. And I'm thinking because I, I'm very glad because you had uh, these uh, different sides of having uh, learned uh, classical Western dance or this, which is uh, really a problem also because uh, if we think today, the best dancer of a ballet dancer, they are uh, either from uh, China, Korea, and Japan. So the best company, they have the principal dancers. And it's, uh, of course, it's an exotic, if we are thinking about, uh, as you were mentioning. So what do we do if we take this uh, same uh, re uh, reasoning? Means that the classical dance, which was born historically in Italy and France, not even Russian they have to perform, not and uh, even more or less uh, Asian or American? That is the problem, actually, because uh, as, uh, I mean, uh, coming from uh, Marxist background, uh, uh, Gramsci background, my own, so all this uh, post-colonial, uh, like uh, subaltern studies, we really question all this. And I want the first one, and to say mea, mea culpa, mea culpa, but, the other discourse, the, which is very Anglo-Saxon too, the risk is a ghettization. I mean, if you are Jewish, you can only do Jewish studies. If you are Italian, you have to do only Italian. We know, for instance, art history, the best scholar, not Italian necessarily. So a with extent we take this, it's a question, eh? yeah. I didn't have an answer. It's a really, is a methodological question, is a political question, social question, yeah. gender question. So, I, so it's yeah. very complicated. So I think you bring up a few points. Um, the first one is this idea that um, non-Europeans are, are succeeding in ballet. So I think that dynamic is, is different here um, because of the history of colonialism and assimilation. Mm. So for example, I am expected to learn how to speak English. So of course, because that is, that is a, a, a language that I've been colonialized to speak, therefore, of course, I should write poetry in English because that I was forced to learn English in school. Um, so it, you can have these societies where we are expecting you to conform to European standards. So of course you should learn ballet at the expense of your own cultures, which is a very different dynamic than being a white person and seeking out a Absolutely. minority or um, a less valued form of dance. So it, in that sense, there is a, an imbalance. So you have to be aware of those dynamics that it's, it's not just, um, we see ballet and ethnic dance. I mean, even that betrays mm. the word that we have ballet mm. and everything else mm. is ethnic mm. dance already betrays that feeling. Um, so because mm. I've been forced to assimilate, 
um, the expectation that I would be good at ballet is not as extreme as someone like Ruth St. Dennis, who mm. was not. Mm. And then she had to go and do the extra work to learn. You know, So again, that's one aspect that as historians, as scholars, we need to be aware mm. of those historical and political differences um, in order to see why someone has success in a particular field. I absolutely agree with you that I think it is very dangerous for us to almost resegregate. Um, I was giving a lecture and, and you know, with some students, and one of the students who was black said, um, I don't think non-black people should be allowed to do African dance. Mm. And I said, but that's just resegregation. And also, how do we learn about each other? You know, the arts are one of the most sublime ways to see each other with more empathy, with more humanity. Culture is meant to be shared, right? If, if, we don't, if we don't have a common language or eat a similar mm. food, how are you gonna see me mm. with nuance? Otherwise it's, ooh, sushi, disgusting, look, you know? Mm. But if, no, I invited you, please try, try this food, try that mm. food, then we can understand each other. So if there's a war somewhere, mm. oh, well, maybe you're actually my brother or my sister mm. um, and not, an exotic person. So culture is a way to cross our differences. Um, and so I think we have to be able to share culture. It's how do we do that with integrity that I think is the question mm. that we are grappling with in the 21st Absolutely. century. Um, also to your point about exploring different experiences. I'm Chinese. Mm. Um, I'm currently directing a production of Madama Butterfly mm. that's taking place and, and dealing with the issue of Japanese incarceration. Mm. So um, I don't, it, it didn't touch me or my family personally. Um, in fact, my grandfather would be very upset that I'm humanizing Japanese people because in his time, Japanese people were the enemy. Um, but mm. I feel like this is an important American story, just mm. like Jews and the Holocaust. That's a mm. story for all of us, not just for Jewish people. So if we only wait for Jewish people to tell the story of the Holocaust, only you're allowed to tell that exactly. story, mm. it will be forgotten. Also, if I'm a Jewish person, what a burden on me. I don't want to talk about the Holocaust. I want to tell jokes. But, but you're forcing me to, to talk about the Holocaust when it should be our Absolutely. shared responsibility because it affects all mm. of us. So I think that, that it is very dangerous mm. to, to think that only a certain person can tell a certain Absolutely. story. Mm. But the question is we have to do it with integrity, which mm. means research, which is what Ruth St. Dennis did, which is listening to mm. each other, which is collaborating with people outside mm -hmm. of your cultural boundaries. Because sometimes as an insider to a culture, as you all know, um, you, some things are invisible. It's just the way we do mm. things. And maybe, maybe you have that experience when you travel to a foreign country or maybe your spouse mm. is from a different culture that you start to see, oh, it, there isn't just one way to do this. You know, the, what I assume is well, truth absolutely. Is, is different. So I think in that way, um, also having an outsider perspective, like I can come in here and say to Pauline, oh my goodness, you French people are so strange. You do this so differently. And Pauline, maybe she never even thought about it and goes, mm. oh, okay, there's something interesting and creative, mm -hmm. or you see something that I don't see because that's just the way it is. So it's sometimes very important when we want to cross these cultural lines to have a cultural insider who knows the contours of the culture, the stereotypes, the problems, but also have an outsider to say, oh, that's interesting, Absolutely. or that's different, or that's special and unique that you might not even see. So a lot of my work is championing cross-cultural collaboration in order to make something new and something better. So. It's, it's not really an answer, no, absolutely, uh, but because just that something a, that we have to consider you know, as artists absolutely. and as scholars. Mm. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I, the, it was wonderful to see the, the film clips and to think about the, you know, the original performance of, of Ruth Sandini and then the, um, how to present that. The, juxtaposition of the two um, made me have a historical question about the role of another American, Loewe Fuller, so an American Parisian, with all of the, and I'm curious from a practitioner's standpoint, all of the, the fabrics that the, the performers were talking about, you know, the circles and the performance. Um, and then <clears throat> that made me think about Loewe Fuller at the 1900 World's Fair, where you have on the one hand human zoos and 
um, Japanese performers who are actually imported from different areas to dance and modern dances created by the Europeans. But at the same time, in Loewe Fuller's theater, she's actually showing classically trained Japanese dancers who are coming up with their own performances for Europeans in 1900. So there's a sort of interesting blend, and I'm curious how, if we go back even further, um, how the appropriation works, or if, if you see, is Loewe Fuller part of these? I don't know, it's not a very good question, but you, you made me see all these interesting connections. So. Maybe it's just a thank you. <laughs> Actually, I didn't study uh, Loewe Fuller uh, processes and uh, work, so I'm a bit unable to answer you by, because my focus was really on uh, Ruth Sandudi and Tetchon, and um, it was also um, an investigation regarding the effects on a team of dancers of nowadays. Uh, embodying uh, these uh, dances and how they would react and all the debates we had around this uh, question. So that was very specific. And so I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't feel like I'm able to answer your question. I don't know, Phil, if I, you yeah, had more ahead, elements. <laughs> Mm. Or the kind of uh, the kind of uh, appropriation that is earlier than the movement. Okay. She's called taking notch dances, circle dances from music halls, and sort of blending them together and creating this sort of artistic version. It's another. French dancer who was a ballet dancer, uh, Cléo de Merode, who um, choreographed and performed some Javanese and Cambodian dances for the Parisian exhibition of 1888, the Javanese, and the 19, the Cambodian, mm. where we can find this earlier even than, you know, or at the same time than Loyes Full. I think Loyes Fuller is also important because she brings uh, Sada Jaco for the exhibition of uh, 1900, so it may be quite different, but well, we can think about it. <laughs> yeah, that's what's so interesting to me, the Sada Jaco. Yeah. yeah. She's actually performing her own Japanese repertoire. Mm -hmm. I think that also brings up an interesting point about performing culture and in a specific heritage. So I think it's very easy for us to see innovation and progress and change in the Western arts. So how much has ballet changed? How much has opera changed? But we, we see these other cultures as being in a, in a static tradition. So Peking opera is how it was 400 years ago, is still what we do today, even though the art form has changed just as radically as classical ballet. I mean, you know, think about the difference between early romantic ballets and now they get their legs up to here and can do eight pirouettes and like that that's radical but but peking opera ba balinese dance all of these other forms have also innovated um, and also making room for individual artistic uh, innovators to create something that isn't in a cultural line but is also their own work as a as an artist so um, thinking about for example my my own work am i continuing on a legacy or am i working am i do i have a distinct unique voice so if i do a baroque inspired chinese dance does that mean that's chinese dance you know or is it am i doing western dance as a chinese person it's it's both at the same time yes of course i'm doing chinese dance because i'm a chinese person and i'm expressing my chinese heritage in my dance but I also studied Horton, you know, and, and, and ballet and all these other forms that is also a part of my vocabulary that is now mixed in and, and it, it just gets messier and messier. But we have to realize that's, that's how it's been done across every culture in every form. We've had this innovation. Um, and so it's, it's almost like a red herring for us to even have these different, be able to box people into these forms. But we also need those boxes in order to understand them. So, so it, 
it's, boy, it's really tough as a scholar <laughs> to think about this stuff. Um, but I think performing um, within a tradition versus as an individual voice. I mean, we would say Balanchine, for example, is, he has his own unique voice, but we would never say, oh, he's performing French culture because he's working in classical ballet, right? Balanchine is not French culture, but it is also French culture because it comes from the courts of France, what he's saying. So it's, I'm just saying it's messy. <laughs> but Absolutely. I'm thinking, just like we were mentioning, um, I was a student of Sanjay Subramanian when he was here in Paris, and he's a this historian, Indian historian, that he formulated this idea of uh, connected histories. And I think that's quite interesting in the sense that we have to think in these terms. It's a, like a borrowing each other and reaching, but as you said, we have to be aware who is borrowing what, what is going back, so giving some back and, or not. The, and what the, for? Exactly, for what purpose? for? And, uh, and how the way, as you said, but we are using this borrowing. Because in fact, I'm thinking, for instance, you were mentioning Mei Lan Fang. And the Mei Lan Fang, I mean, uh, Bertolt Brecht in uh, Moscow in 1935, I think. Um, he was there in Moscow and he met Mei Lan Fang. And he was so uh, amazed by the, and uh, we cannot understand the work of uh, Bertolt Brecht and uh, his idea of uh, staging and uh, the acting without uh, this meeting with uh, Mei Fang. So how he made, I mean, how these are uh, giving birth so many interesting creative. Yeah. So in that way, and uh, if we, avoid this, uh, as you said, uh, what said it will be this word. <laughs> I, I have one more, this, uh, interaction. I have one more clue uh, that might help us uh, frame this too. Um, as, a, as a Chinese choreographer, when I'm working within my, my vocabulary, the reality is whatever I put on stage, the impact is going to be on me as a Chinese person. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to make something that bastardizes Chinese culture or is out of context or is, you know, in some ways doesn't have integrity because the reality is when I leave the theater and I go into the street, if I make something that is, is it doesn't have integrity, that encourages people to, to spit on me, uh. for example, or to, to it, it contributes to this anti-Asian-ness uh. that a white person might not have that same sensitivity if they're trying to make a Chinese story because at the end of the day they can take off the Chinese costume Absolutely. and go and just be a normal French person again. Exactly. Whereas I have to live the burden of whatever I put out there as my culture, I have to live with the consequences outside in a way that Ruth St. Denis did not. She didn't have to think, mm. how is someone going to see in all of Indian culture based on what I put out on stage in my personal artistic choice as an Indian dance. She, she took off the makeup and then she could just go to a restaurant and be herself. Mm -hmm. Whereas artists from that tradition, mm -hmm. they don't have that privilege. Okay. They don't have that luxury. And so I think that is where the, the question in my work of integrity versus authenticity mm -hmm. is very important because you might say, yes, that is an authentic Indian dance that Ruth St. Dennis is doing, but does it have cultural integrity? Well, if she takes off the makeup and can go you know, Do. maybe not, right? So, so that is where I think um, it's a clue. It's not an answer, but it's a Absolutely. clue. Do Ruth St. Dennis, uh, she write herself in her autobiography. She was so shocked when I arrived in India. And she said, if I was uh, going in India before creating Radha, Radha would never have been there. Yes. Right. So it was uh, such a, a slap on yeah. her face. Yeah. So then she realized our imagination of India was really have a little to do so and as you say that the both uh, they were quite scared yeah so because uh, there is the, the they were the they realized exactly yes because uh, till they were in america very much mediatized because uh, there was a uh, hollywood uh, behind i mean uh, finally all these other scholars they realized that uh, there were so many roots and dennis in europe uh, perhaps even better than her and that that uh, and decorate, I mean, made an excellent work. 
and that they didn't have the same projection also because, uh, I mean, uh, it was also another contest uh, that of uh, Roots and Dennis with uh, Hollywood behind, mm -hmm. where she worked. And right. she did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, uh, <laughs> yes, yes, again, it's a question of a political, of uh, uh, monopoly certain types of things. Exactly, uh, and, uh, who, who is so visible and who has a mean Who is speaking, for whom, and from which place. Exactly. From and each hier hierarchical place. Yes, and uh, I had the feeling when I started to get into these dances at the beginning, I was not so much aware of these issues. So the fact to, uh, we, we embodied these dances mm. uh, made all these layers arrive and uh, I really felt that my, uh, you are, I, I love this world, uh, this w word, integrity. I, I felt that as a white woman, a European white woman, I had to, I, could, I, I couldn't speak as you are talking about that because uh, I, am, I am getting interested in another uh, culture which is an American culture, uh, North American culture and and I am re, um, I am, an, an, comment dit héritier, uh, I inherited from, uh, partly from this culture, and I felt I, I had to also try to deconstruct all the layers of this heritage, because I think this, uh, not so many people in, in France uh, are aware of all these uh, dimensions and the political issues that are also uh, contained in so, these beautiful objects. And I thought it was really interesting, interesting with this uh, team of uh, performers to uh, question uh, these uh, issues. And they were mostly uh, quite critical, as you, can, as you could uh, hear, uh, about these dances, but we really had a lot of, of discussions about uh, what are the effects and who gets the benefits of uh, this uh, utilization of these uh, uh, symbols that are really uh, cultural symbols, including a context, and what happens uh, when you take them out of the context and uh, to just reinvent things. And we had the feeling uh, that uh, Ruth Sandani didn't quote it that much, the dances she, were, she was using, even if she studied them. And, she, uh, and it, it's a part of the time. I mean, she was not so, so much aware of the specificities of uh, each country and each uh, specific dances. And, but all of that has to be, um, I think, uh, discussed. Uh, to be, and to see that dance is a fantastic medium to be uh, to exchange culture and exchange uh, kinesthesia, etc. But it's also a, a super strong medium to embody uh, cliches and stereotypes. And uh, I felt that was very important to try to deconstruct uh, where the stereotypes can be. Merci beaucoup, uh, merci beaucoup. Je vous propose que on continue la conversation. Il y a un verre et des petits fours qui nous attendent à la sortie. Um, so we can um, follow the discussion with um, a drink and a few bites to eat. Uh, thank you very much to all uh, of you. And uh, let me just uh, also um, mention the fact that um, we're also grateful that, that Phil gave a lecture with Duke Fellington last week on his um, process of reinventing and recreating La Bayadère. Um, and so this is now online on the YouTube channel of the Institute. And uh, it was a really wonderful presentation. So thank you again for that. And it echoes very well the, the study day today. So uh, thank you to you both. And uh, merci à toutes et tous. Et on peut aller prendre un verre. Voilà. <laughs>